Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Marika Mikuria, and I am the Symposium Editor of the East Asia Law Review of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And I would like to welcome you all to the 2016 Symposium. Uh, before we start, we'd like to ask you to kindly silence your phone. Photographs can be taken. And we're also filming this remarkable event, so there's no need to take any videos. Uh, as you can see from the program, this symposium will consist of three parts. Uh, we will first have our preliminary talks, then the first panel will start at 2 p.m. and last one hour and 20 minutes, then we'll take a coffee break at 3.20. And then we will uh, have our second panel from 3.40 and conclude the event with a reception at 5.10. Uh, each speaker will give a 10 or 15 minutes presentation and we hope that you, the audience, can join in the discussion about international wildlife trafficking during the Q&A section. And we also hope that you can stay for the reception and exchange your thoughts with each other and meet our distinguished guests. So I would like to pass on to our editor-in-chief, Ant Anthony Jean, who will be introducing the speakers from the pre preliminary talk as well as from panel one. Thank you. How's everyone doing today? It's a nice Friday outside. I'm glad you guys all chose to spend it with us. Uh, my name is Anthony Jin, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Volume 11 of the East Asia Law Review. Historically, our journal has been focused on the high-impact issues that affect East Asia. Um, in previous years, the symposium has covered topics like criminal procedure reform in China, as well as international IP rights. But this year, um, it's an exciting year for the journal, as well as for the symposium. Um, so shortly, this journal will be renamed the Asia Law Review as a me method of indicating our broadened focus to all areas of Asia, including Thailand, India, Indonesia, and countries that are affected by topics like international wildlife trafficking. So this symposium is a reflection of our broadened focus, um, a topic that impacts all of Asia and impacts all of the world, internationally speaking. And it is a, a goal for us to, to have bring these discussions and bring this scholarship to Penn so that we can have these discussions and further the, the academic discourse on this topic. Today, Marika has brought together an amazing set of speakers um, covering both domestic, international, and private sector uh, efforts to combat international wildlife crime. So I'd like to thank Marika for all of her effort, for all of her team's efforts, because she conceptualized, executed, and brought this into fruition. So thank you, Marika, for all of your efforts. And next, we will have um, Professor Delisle, who is a professor here at the law school, as well as a political science professor at Penn, co-chair of Penn's, Penn Law's Center for Asian Law, as well as the director of Penn's um, Center for East Asian Studies. Jacques Delisle. Uh, thank you, Anthony. It's a pleasure to be here today. And it's uh, the latest in a series of really terrific symposia that the formerly East Asian Law Review, now uh, Pan-Asian, if you will, Asian Law Review, uh, has been doing. And I congratulate Anthony as the editor-in-chief and Marika as the symposium organizer for, for keeping up that tradition uh, and taking us into yet another uh, really interesting topic. There have been issues on you know, uh, corruption, uh, antitrust, a whole bunch of issues down through the years. And this year's uh, issue is no less important uh, than any of the others. And once again, uh, Marika and others have put together really just a terrific uh, lineup of specialists, and I think it's one of the real highlights of the programming we have on Asian law and international comparative law here more generally. What tends to make this symposium particularly special is not only that the students take an even greater role than is typically the case, but it also does a wonderful job of bringing together practitioners and academics, a little less stodgy than the purely academic conferences that, uh, that happen when you let professors organize them. Um, so I just wanted to say a, a few words by way of introduction. Anthony's covered a lot of what's going on here around the law school. The East Asia Law Review is soon to be the Asia Law Review really is, I think, one of the leading uh, specialty journals in the field and has really come from quite recent and modest origins to really being a terrific uh, publication that attracts uh, really terrific contributions from leading scholars and practitioners in the field. As I said, the symposium has been a, a terrific tradition as well. It's been quite uh, successful. Um, and uh, as this year's group of panelists uh, amply reflects, it really has attracted uh, the top people in the relevant fields. So I'm just to say a couple of words about the subject matter that we're addressing here today. It's uh, not really my specialty, but it's, it's a subject that I find quite compelling. Uh, as probably everyone here knows, the illegal international traffic in wildlife is huge. Uh, hard to get good figures on these kinds of things which are illegal and hidden, but billions of dollars by any estimate. Hundreds of millions of individual specimens of plants and animals. 
uh, and uh, are 35,000 species that are officially covered uh, by the CITES treaties and many others uh, that perhaps should be. Uh, and we've seen, by most accounts, a spike in recent uh, years uh, and certainly a spike in concern and, and efforts to respond, perhaps the most dramatic recently being the destruction of many tons of ivory. But that's just the one of many, many examples one could cite. And the consequences here are huge. They range across a wide area of subjects. There is the obvious environmental consequence of the destruction and endangerment of many species uh, that are in trouble even absent uh, poaching and illegal trade just through environmental pressures. Uh, there is, of course, collateral damage, the other species that get killed in the process of trying to collect the species that are illicitly traded. Uh, there are ties to cross-national, transnational crime more generally, the networks that trade in illegal species often are uh, spilling over into other aspects of international crime. Uh, you see corruption of governments, uh, those who are bribed uh, to look the other way. Uh, in some countries where this is a particularly important phenomenon, it can be corrosive of the rule of law in those countries more generally. It, of course, is distorting and disruptive and destructive to local communities affected uh, by poaching. Uh, and it can even have impacts on human health. I remember back in my early days of going to China, there was something in, in Guangzhou and Canton uh, back in the 80s that we used to refer to as the takeout zoo. Uh, I mean, you could basically go in and find almost anything, uh, and that's the pathways by which we get SARS uh, and other such. Uh, such things. Now, there are many, many admirable efforts to take on this huge challenge of dealing with these many problems that are brought about by international wildlife crime. Uh, they operate at many levels. Uh, I'm sure we'll hear a fair amount about the Committee on International Trade, I'm uh, sorry, the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species sites, uh, and uh, possibly also about the UN Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, which intersects with this. 181 countries, I think, at last count are part of sites, so it's really quite far reaching, and that's a good old traditional public international law way of dealing with this, creating obligations on signatory states uh, to have the right laws and to take appropriate measures. Ultimately, of course, much of the responsibility falls to individual states, both on the exporter side and the importer side. Uh, Asia has been prominent on both sides of it, uh, of course, uh, and so it is up to, to member states and to even non-member states of sites to attempt to deal with this. We've also seen an area here of robust growth of non-governmental organizations, uh, those in the wildlife area generally, like the World Wildlife Fund, uh, and entities like Traffic, which try to monitor uh, the illicit trade and, and help uh, bring the problem to global attention. The solutions, of course, are partly supply side and partly demand side. On the supply side, a question of getting countries that are home to these species to have better laws on the books, to have better implementation of those laws, and to develop the capacities and the will and the best practices for dealing with <coughs> these problems. On the importer side, some of those same solutions uh, or same attempted solutions apply. Uh, but there's also a question of demand side reduction, uh, education, persuasion, uh, publicity. Uh, to, do, to use another China anecdote, it's mostly I work on. I remember when you started, not too many years ago, seeing posters by prominent Chinese celebrities, including no less than Yao Ming, who's about the height of a giraffe, so it's appropriate, uh, you know, sort of making the pitch uh, for why you shouldn't be doing this. And that's a, a welcome development, and all of these things, I think, are, are you know, terrific steps forward, but it is an immense and daunting problem. Uh, and unlike me, everyone else pretty much you're going to be hearing from, or almost everyone else you're going to be hearing from today, ha has really uh, got skin in the game, has really been working on these issues. I commend them for their efforts, and I look forward to all of us learning from them this afternoon. Thank you. Our next speaker will be part of the first panel, which is the role of federal agencies as well as international organizations in combating international wildlife crime. Our first speaker is Robert Dreher. He is the Associate Director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, he represents the service's interests to the Department of the Interior as well as to the broader administration and serves as the Principal Policy Advisor for the Director. Thank you for coming today. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you for inviting me to speak. It's um, great and if I want to bring that thing up. Click on okay. and it can okay. do it. Um, so this is a very important discussion, and it's a um, particularly apt forum for the. Uh, I now understand it's the Asia Law Review to have hosted this. Um, wildlife trafficking is a uh, an ongoing international conservation crisis. Um, it threatens the very existence of wildlife species that, that uh, we would have expected and hoped that our children would be able to see in the wild, not just in zoos, species like elephants and tigers and 
rhinoceros, um, as well as a whole host of lesser known species like the pangolin um, and uh, the, 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 the vaquita, the, the world's smallest uh, porpoise. Um, I brought some uh, examples of uh, the articles that are, that are subject to this trade, and I'll show you those in a second. Um, but it, it's not just a conservation crisis that, that really has exacerbated the pressures of, of human development on uh, wildlife populations. It's also a, an, in a, an international crisis in uh, law and order. Um, it threatens the integrity and the security of nations, range nations, transit nations, um, and uh, demand nations. Um, rampant bribery of public officials um, and, frankly, the killing of rangers and other law enforcement officials that get in the way. A thousand rangers in Africa killed in the last decade. These are people that uh, um, earn, you know, very small amounts of money, put on a uniform, often without weapons, although now they're, they're beginning to, to try to uh, match the firearms that uh, the poachers are bringing in. A thousand of them killed in the last decade trying to protect wildlife. Um, and, and what makes it sort of particularly apt is that I think it's a, uh, a world crisis that the United States can play a particular leading role, but best if it can do it in partnership with other leading countries, including probably most importantly China. Um, the, the crisis is being fed by a mounting sort of affluence and demand for wildlife products in countries that, that have traditional uh, uses of wildlife products countries in Southeast Asia, China, Vietnam, uh, the other countries in Southeast Asia. But make no mistake, it's also being fed by a rising demand in the United States. The United States is the second largest market for wildlife products, both legal and illegal. Um, and it's a major market for all of the wildlife, uh, illegal wildlife products that we are trying to, uh, we're trying to stop. Uh, it's a huge market for illegal wildlife products, both living and dead, coming out of Latin America. Um, so we are a big part of the problem, um, and uh, I had the privilege of spending 10 days with uh, my, my boss, the Secretary of Interior, on a trip to Africa two weeks ago, um, where we went to Gabon and to Kenya and to South Africa, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the very end. Um, and that was her message, that we are coming not to, not to tell African countries what they should do, but to admit that we are part of the problem and to offer our help and to listen to them and find out what they need. Um, the Fish and Wildlife Service plays a particular role in the United States efforts to combat wildlife trafficking, and that's what I'm going to talk about. But um, a big part of what we have tried to do together with the Department of State and the Department of Justice and other federal agencies um, is to engage uh, the leadership of other nations around the world, and again, particularly China. Um, it was a probably the most hopeful uh, event in the last year uh, in the fight against wildlife trafficking that, uh, that President Xi met with uh, President Obama and, th and they jointly pledged to end the trade in ivory in their, in their countries. Fish and Wildlife Service is charged with uh, implementing that ban on ivory in the United States and we have a rule that would do that, um, which I can also mention in a minute. Um, so uh, we have a, a national strategy to combat wildlife trafficking that was uh, written by, and I think John may tell you more about this, but it's, it was written by a task force of 17 federal agencies led by the Department of the Interior, the Department of State, and the Department of Justice, um, uh, and created by an executive order that President Obama issued in 2013, um, highlighting the importance of this effort to the United States. Uh, and I have to say, as I said, it's, it's not just a conservation crisis, it's a crisis in national security. Among the agencies that are most concerned about this are the National Security Council, the Department of Defense, um, the intelligence community, because this is a crisis which, like other trafficking in uh, illegal uh, products, trafficking in arms, trafficking in human beings, trafficking in drugs, um, threatens uh, world security. Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service's role, I mean, we're, we're uh, basically the lead uh, agency implementing more than half of the recommendations and goals of the national strategy that, that has been developed, in part because we have such a broad engagement with wildlife uh, law enforcement and conservation policy. Um, we're, uh, not to crow too much about us, but uh, we're actually pretty unique. We're the only agency in the world that has a dedicated law enforcement arm dedicated solely to wildlife crime. 
These are fully accredited law enforcement officials. They can arrest you, they can take you to jail, they are armed, um, and they focus solely on wildlife crime. We have 100 uh, port inspectors that work with the Customs and, and Border uh, Protection um, at ports of entry around the United States that are designated as ports of entry for wildlife products. And they take the lead in examining uh, incoming shipments for illegal wildlife products. Again, a role that other countries uh, engage their wildlife services in, but one where in our country um, we have uh, clear legal authority to do it in conjunction with Customs and Border Patrol, Border uh, Protection. Um, we also have an international program, uh, which is, which is um, really important to our efforts. We give relatively small amounts of money, but significant amounts of money, um, $17 million last year for, uh, to assist wildlife trafficking efforts around the world, primarily in range states, primarily to help them in their capacity building. Um, millions of dollars more that we give under our multi-species um, conservation funds to support conservation of species like the elephant and the rhinoceros. And that comes together, as you'll see when I get to, I'm going to quickly get to the point where I describe our trip together, but one of the things that we're finding is that you can't fight wildlife trafficking on the ground uh, without doing two really crucial things. Um, one of them, of course, is addressing demand. If you aren't trying to address the demand in countries like China and Vietnam and in the United States, um, the, the prices being offered on the illegal market are so high that they will drive criminal activity. And it's easy to understand why. I mean, if you're an African villager, you can earn a year's pay for killing one rhino. And, and, and people in range countries are very poor. Um, and so it's an enormous enticement. So cutting demand is crucial to addressing this. In fact, I don't think we can be successful as we do it. Um, but the second issue is engaging the communities. Um, for the very reason that they are vulnerable to uh, the poachers, they're vulnerable to, to violence because these folks are, are highly armed. They're vulnerable to bribery because they're very poor. Um, finding ways to engage uh, communities in Africa in wildlife conservation so that they get the benefit from wildlife conservation is critical. This goes beyond poaching. The biggest single challenge, the range countries, certainly in Africa, uh, but elsewhere in the world as well, uh, face where they're developing countries, is figuring out how to maintain the balance between human development and wildlife conservation. Maintaining open range for animals like the African lion. If you're a villager in, in Africa and you're trying to uh, herd cattle and it's your primary source of wealth and your primary uh, way of supporting your family, a lion can come into your corral and kill your cattle and wipe out your life's earnings and put your family at risk of starvation and so they poison lions. Um, we've just listed the, the African lion as threatened. Uh, uh, one one subpopulation is, is endangered. And it's threatened not because of poaching, it's threatened because, or hunting, it's threatened because of uh, human population pressures and the loss of range. Um, so finding a way to engage communities. One of the communities I'm going to show you in a second is a community in, uh, in Kenya where they've established um, a, a rangeland trust and conservancies where the villages that were frankly feuding villages for hundreds of years, raiding each other's cattle, have come together to cooperate in uh, grazing and in wildlife management. They're making money from phototourism. They've got a security system set up with armed patrols and a command center and a helicopter. I mean, it, this is pretty sophisticated stuff. And they've virtually eliminated poaching because everybody in that community uh, is invested in this. And when a poacher comes on their land, it gets reported immediately. By contrast, Kruger National Park in South Africa, they're losing three rhinos a day. Um, there are only about 20,000 rhinos in the world. Uh, there's about 10,000 of them in Kruger. And they're losing, um, a, they're losing 1,000 or more a year, 1,200 a year. That's unsustainable. They're going to drive the, the rhino population to extinction. And in that setting, despite enormously sophisticated policing and, and patrolling and uh, technology, um, they're losing the fight because the poachers have the, pretty much the full support of local villages, villages that are outside Kruger National Park that do not get any benefit from the park um, and that openly assist the poachers, guide them to the rhinos. So that challenge is a big one for us, and we give money to support community uh, development efforts. All right, so, so those are sort of the roles we play. We play a strong role in law enforcement. One of the key things that we've done around the world has been to place uh, special agents, highly trained investigative agents, 
in uh, embassies around the world as law enforcement attaches to coordinate with other governments, law enforcement officials, and to assist them in trying to uh, develop their strategies to tackle wildlife trafficking. Um, we provide conservation funding. We're the CITES authority for the United States, and we'll be playing a strong role in the upcoming uh, Convention of the Parties in September in South Africa uh, to push for even stronger resolutions and measures to combat wildlife trafficking through that international forum. Um, and we're heavily engaged in, in demand man, uh, demand side management uh, reduction. Um, we, there's an entity that has been formed that is quite promising that we think called the U.S. Alliance Against Wildlife Trafficking, which is made up of both NGOs and of prominent businesses uh, that are making public commitments to use their best efforts to eliminate uh, the transport of wildlife products or the, the utilization of their chains of, of communication by, by the poachers. Um, so so th that's the range of activity we're engaged in. Let me quickly uh, show you, at least I hope this will come up, uh, a little bit of what we saw when we were in Africa. So that's my boss, uh, and that's in Gabon. Um, and, uh, and we are there to look at forest elephants. We're in a presidential preserve there, the Wanga Wange Wange, uh, Wanga Wange Preserve. Uh, that's you can sort of see me right behind her with the binoculars, and um, and this is a, a preserve that we have funded. It has gone from a, a sort of a safe haven for poaching to a place that now has a highly trained ranger force, security force, a new uh, national park police that have eliminated poaching in this park. Now we're trying to replicate that and spread it to other parks. It's not easy. One of the parks in Gabon is on the border with Cameroon. They're being infiltrated by, uh, by terrorists with AK-47s, and the president there has sent, in Gabon has just sent the, the, uh, uh, the paratroopers in instead of park rangers because the park rangers are, are so badly outgunned. All right, now that's not what I'm hoping to find. <laughs> but it's, a, it, it's a good thing. So th these are the forest elephants in Gabon. They're, they're about two-thirds the size of the elephants you're probably used to seeing, and they're they're so deaf they can slip between the trees and the rainforest, this kind of rainforest, and just live there. That's my boss again. Uh, you get these commercials. Sorry, I didn't know they were there. Uh, there's, there's some of the forest elephants. This is, uh, this is my boss uh, at an elephant orphanage in Kenya. Uh, these are orphaned elephants, orphaned by poachers. Um, and usually an orphaned elephant, if it doesn't receive the care of a specialized institution like this, will die of, literally of a broken heart. Within a matter of a few weeks, they just starve to death. They're so heartbroken at losing their, their parents. Um, and this, uh, this sanctuary has been able to find a way to actually give them nonstop emotional care and get them to the point where they can mature and then be reintroduced. That's the U.S. Ambassador to Kenya, Bob Godek, with my boss, Sally Jewell. Here she's signing a uh, memorandum of understanding with uh, the Minister of the Environment and Natural Resources in Kenya, which will provide a vehicle for more funding going to Kenya, meeting with NGOs in Kenya, one of the most important things we do. That's Pennsylvania welcoming us. Thank you. Um, the, the head of uh, USAID. Uh, here she's laying a wreath at uh, the Memorial for Fallen Rangers, uh, because Kenya has rangers being killed every year. Um, this is the, uh, the lab they have, a forensics lab. We have the world's leading forensics lab in Ashland, Oregon. Um, we've helped these folks set this up, um, and they're, they're presenting forensic evidence now in court and getting convictions based on it. John will tell you more about the challenges of that since, since he actually prosecutes all these folks. Um, all right, so I think that's enough. These are just some sense of, of what we were trying to do. There's the baby elephants again and uh, more MOU signing and that sort of thing. And that helicopter and the, that night vision equipment there, that's, that's my boss presenting that to the Kenyan Park, uh, the Kenyan uh, Wildlife Service. Um, actually, this is in South Africa. I apologize. This is actually in Kruger. And that's the head of security for Kruger and the minister for, uh, uh, for the environment. And this is funding provided by the State Department through, the, uh, through its uh, International Narcotics uh, Office. So an, an agency of the State Department that is primarily engaged in fighting international crime because of uh, its threat to world security is heavily engaged in providing the funding and the equipment uh, to help uh, the range countries fight this kind of poaching. So, in conclusion, I mean, that gives you some sense of, of what we saw. Let me mention one thing, just to, just to give you a sense of how, how much of a challenge this is. One of the things we did was we toured the port of Mombasa in Kenya, and we sat in a room. Uh, they showed us their, their security patrols and their dogs. They have found no contraband in that port for a year. 
and yet it's being found going into ports like like thailand and hong kong. it's coming from mombasa. it's one of the major ports of export for 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 blood ivory and they found none of it in mombasa. so they've they've got a whole new patrol system set up un odc is part of it the kenyan wildlife service is part of it but they know there is corruption so we sat in this room with the head of the port and the head of the port security and all these officials after it was over, Sally said to me, she thought it was the most uncomfortable meeting she thought she'd ever been in. She was convinced that some of the people around the table were part of the problem. Uh, they were evasive. And, and lo and behold, two days ago, the President Kenyatta fired almost everybody in the room uh, for corruption and brought corruption charges against them. Now, I, I'd like to know why we ended up in the room with those folks, because <laughs> when you're advancing a meeting for your boss with the Secretary of Interior, that's not the kind of meeting you want to have or end up in. But you know they, they had to wait until they had uh, the right moment. So that gives you a sense of the challenges we're up against, but also how much you know how much we have to work together to stop this. Um, we're trying to give our law enforcement officials the best tools, uh, and John will talk a little bit about that in terms of how we need changes in the law. Um, we're trying to reduce consumer demand that's driving this. We're trying to support sustainable economic development so we can get community engagement. Um, and we need all of that if we're going to fight this. Thank you. And by the way, so that's a rhino horn and uh, an ivory tusk. Those are real. Those are exhibits. Uh, those are uh, specimens that are actual exhibits from criminal cases. And the, the golden object is a totalaba bladder. That's a fish bladder that's highly desired in, in Chinese uh, uh, cuisine and traditional medicine. Um, and it is, it's probably worth $10,000. Um, and it is driving that species of fish extinct, and it's also driving extinct the vaquita, the, the species of dolphin that gets entangled in the fishing nets for this. So it gives you a sense of the range of, uh, of items that we're fighting. Thank you. Um, it was definitely interesting to talk about the, the, just the danger the rangers go through every day, just a little hanged up for myself. I had a friend from high school who ended up being a park ranger in Tanzania. Uh, between college and grad school, and he, he did that for about two years. And I remember him telling me stories about patrolling at night in the park and like just the sheer fear that he felt because they would find carcasses of animals throughout. And um, these poachers would come in every night, every week, and it was almost like he'd gone to war because he just was kind of on edge when I first met him in South Africa. But um, it definitely like strikes close to home when you hear about that type of action and that type of experience in a place that's supposed to be protecting wildlife. So thank you, uh, Mr. Dreher, for speaking about your experiences. The next speaker we have is John Cruden. Uh, John Cruden is the Assistant Attorney General for the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the Department of Justice. Uh, the ENRD is responsible for, primarily responsible for litigation controlling, in addition to wildlife protection, pollution, Indian lands, and other aspects uh, within the United States. They operate as um, a de facto environmental law firm fighting for the people and for the causes that impact us. Um, here in America. So thank you for coming today. Thank you. This is fun. It's fun to actually have you all. Uh, some of you people are interested uh, uh, in an area that I am uh, uh, passionate about. This is a great conference. I really applaud the Law Review for putting it together. Uh, and I'm honored to be sharing the time with a, a great set of uh, panelists who are really experts uh, in uh, 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 this area. Uh, so in my time with you, I'm going to try to do three things. I'm going to do a little bit uh, about the environment division I'm in because we are the prosecutors. Uh, and I'll tell you something about that. I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, uh, how this fits into the administration's policy. I'm the co-chair of the President's Task Force on Illegal Wildlife uh, 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 Trafficking. Uh, and then transition uh, to two other things, some of the things we're doing in capacity building, and then I'll tell you a couple of cases, a couple of cases that we just recently have brought to conclusion uh, that I just want you to uh, uh, know about. Um, but it is uh, uh, truly appropriate that I'm following uh, Bob Dreher because Bob has the investigative capacity. So anything that I talk about that we're doing well is because we're on the backs of uh, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service and others who are, in fact, uh, 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 giving us that. But also, just to embed into you, when, when we're talking about uh, uh, chaos, uh, and we're talking about really a international, not just a national, international uh, 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 problem, 
uh, um, some months ago when I testified before the House Foreign Relations Committee, I said uh, uh, that uh, we, if we are on the pathway we're on right now, statistically the pathway we're on right now, in our lifetime, in our appropriate lifetime, there will not be elephants and rhinoceroses. You will be showing pictures to your children uh, of what they used to look like. Uh, uh, and that uh, uh, cannot occur, right? That We just cannot do that. But when you hear uh, um, from uh, the leading official in the Fish and Wildlife Service talking about three rhinoceros a, a day uh, uh, there, you can do the math uh, and, and figure out uh, 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 what it happens. By the way, when I'm announcing, uh, uh, because we have a program we're doing uh, with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service that we call Operation Crash, Crash is a whole herd of rhinoceroses, when I'm announcing some particular case, and I'll tell you about one in a minute, you know, the demand side of that, what you have over there, what uh, Bob Dreyer brought from you, is a little rhino horn. Uh, in a, in, you know, I have a fake one because if I had a real one, it would, you know, if I, you know, that would be a problem for me to have it. Uh, uh, so as a prosecutor, so I have a fake one, which is about, I don't know, maybe two and a half foot, that I show at press conferences. It weighs about 10 pounds. Street value that, somewhere between 250 and $300,000. Uh, uh, there and, and what you do with the rhino horn is you grind it up and you put a little mixture and you give it to you know somebody who believes that passionately believes uh, uh, that it will help uh, you know do enormous number of great medicinal things maybe grow hair I don't know if I maybe I should try uh, 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 there it does not uh, it's the same substance as your fingernails uh, and so it really does not have uh, that value, but that does not preclude the demand of all of this. And the demand, as you've already heard, is not in the millions, it's in the billions of dollars. And it's a criminal issue because the same people that are taking value out of this are also doing drugs and human trafficking and other things. And we do believe there is a connection between the enormous profits uh, uh, going here that are also uh, feeding uh, organized crime. Um, so with all of that in mind, uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, toward the beginning of this administration, the president, by executive order, set up uh, uh, the task force that I now uh, uh, co-chair with uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, uh, Department of State. Uh, we've been doing things. We've been doing things the last uh, uh, a few years. We have an entire plan. And the plan, at its broadest sense, is, is exactly what you would think it would emphasize on. If I, if I polled you, you would agree. These are the things that we need to do. What I'm involved in, what I will talk almost exclusively about, uh, is uh, enforcement, both domestic and international. That's important. Uh, it's not enough. Uh, 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 you've got to do demand side. You absolutely have to do uh, uh, demand side, and that's uh, uh, difficult. Uh, and then, uh, uh, again, things that Bob Dreher has already mentioned, uh, a, a global cooperation that is not doing just, not just government entities, but private uh, uh, partnerships and NGOs as well. Uh, both of them are integral to our success. Uh, we have a plan with, which is all public. There's a website for all of this. It's a very detailed plan which gives responsibilities to agencies across uh, uh, the United States. We meet regularly uh, to go over that plan. I shared the last one. Uh, uh, of that, and there's a lot of enthusiasm, there's a lot of adrenaline, and people like the Department of Defense and National Security uh, uh, Council are very much involved because they can see the national security uh, uh, problems associated with uh, uh, this uh, uh, wave of criminal conduct. This is criminal conduct. Do not lose sight of that uh, 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 in uh, uh, what we're seeing. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, joining Bob and others and, and leading the delegation last year to Africa to uh, a World Wildlife Conference where we had uh, uh, literally 30 or 40 uh, uh, countries, all of the African countries uh, 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 were there, and, and we got to talk to the leaders. And we also got to talk to uh, offline to Chinese leaders and Vietnam uh, uh, leaders as being part of the problem, frankly. Uh, uh, there. So the one thing I would say without question is uh, uh, they were committed because there's a, a lot of reasons why uh, any of the uh, uh, countries would be committed is, is obviously a money value. There's a tourism uh, value uh, to them and it's not lost on any of the African leaders uh, that this is part of their national heritage. But challenging, right? This is incredibly challenging. Uh, um, I can remember talking to the head of the National Park Service of Kenya. And I asked him, like over lunch, um, uh, what is your biggest challenge? And he said, we are outgunned. 
i thought that was like a metaphor for something and i said what what do you mean and he said i mean they have bigger and better guns than we have our rangers are struggling with things that were left over from world war ii and they have mortars and rocket propelled grenade launchers and that just adds to that and as you've already heard rangers are dying that just adds right it just adds to the difficulty of putting this together uh, and, and we heard from that, and there is energy. There will be another conference, maybe even in Vietnam this year, uh, uh, there. So things are happening uh, uh, there. It was historic uh, when the two presidents in China uh, and the United States come together to pledge themselves to reducing. Uh, uh, that's, that's absolutely historic, and we've seen things happening uh, uh, in that regard. So that clearly there's some positive steps that are happening, but the challenges are still uh, uh, enormous. Uh, in that regard. Uh, one of the challenges that we have found now as prosecutors, so this is my transition uh, from talking policy in general to uh, what we're doing on capacity building, one of our challenges as we talk to judges and prosecutors is it, this turns out to be a specialized practice of law. What you have to do as a prosecutor to in fact find the evidence, to use effectively laboratories, uh, uh, just to have people report the crime to you, uh, 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 requires some knowledge. Uh, when we were there in Africa, uh, what we were getting, uh, uh, people were telling us and, and being very pleased about all this, they were giving us arrest statistics. Now think about that for a minute. We actually don't do that in the United States. You don't see that much arrest statistics. What you see is prosecution statistics. And yet when we talked to some of the African leaders, they actually did not know who their prosecutor was. Enormous gulf uh, between those who are investigating or even arresting and those who are actually taking that final step. And to be effective, as you all know, in the rule of law, you actually have to be able to take uh, that final uh, 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 step. And so with funding from the State Department, we sent a team of prosecutors over. Uh, we met last fall uh, with judges and prosecutors from six African countries. The response was overwhelming. They wanted to do these cases. They were enthusiastic to do uh, these cases. Interestingly enough, for uh, 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 those of us who are used to different states uh, out there, they have the same issue where, in fact, the border is not different states, it's different countries. And yet the animals don't have that restriction. Uh, they're going freely back and forth. Um, and by the way, the poachers don't have that restriction. They're also going freely back and forth. And we found that prosecutors were actually meeting each other for the first time. And yet they had very shared concerns and very shared needs. So we spent a lot of time with them. Uh, we have course materials. We're still in contact with them. And we will go back this year. We'll go back to the same group and say how you're doing. Uh, uh, so we can actually make sure that you're involved in all of that. because. Even, and I'm going to tell you a couple of our cases. I'm very proud of what we're doing. Without question, uh, in the world, we're the leading prosecutorial entity of wildlife crime. And, and I would be the first to say, you cannot prosecute your way out of this problem. Uh, uh, you need the capacity of judges. You need the capacity of countries who cares. You need NGOs. You need a lot of different parts of this uh, to work. But this is one part, one part of it uh, that we did. And we will now not only go back, but we're expanding uh, uh, what we're doing as training. We're also doing some in South America. I'm not doing that right now because uh, uh, our focus is more uh, uh, on some of the wildlife and I'm trying to tie it in eventually to Asia. Uh, uh, but again, capacity building, uh, certainly uh, a key part of what we're doing uh, and uh, 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 very important. Keep moving. Now, now I'm back to what we do for a living. Uh, uh, one part, the Environment and Natural Resources Division, uh, which is largely in Washington, uh, uh, where I was this morning. By the way, it's cold there this, too this morning. Uh, uh, there, uh, I live along the Potomac River, so you get the sweep of the cold coming right there uh, 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 when you come. Uh, but I wanted to see you all uh, 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 there. So we have, it's a, it's, a, a, it's a large environmental law firm. We have roughly 650 people. 450 of them are lawyers. Most are in D.C., uh, uh, but we have about a half dozen uh, uh, offices across the United States, all doing court work. Uh, everybody there are litigators. That's what we do for a living uh, is uh, uh, go to federal court and represent the United States uh, in court. One aspect of all of them that we do uh, is enforcement. Uh, we're bringing cases uh, on behalf of the United States, which we do civilly. Uh, so last year it was Deepwater Horizon. This year it's Volkswagen. Uh, uh, 
and criminally. Uh, uh, and our world wildlife, our, our wildlife cases are, are not exclusively, but pretty much criminal actions done by our, our environmental crime section. Uh, so we have a section uh, that does, again, exclusively uh, 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 criminal activity. Their responsibility I could divide right now in a kind of thirds. One third would be like your traditional environmental crime. There are still people in the United States uh, 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 taking things that come out of their factories that are poisonous to us in 55-gallon drums and walking down the hill and dumping them into a river. That is illegal. Uh, uh, and it's still happening, and we prosecute them uh, uh, when we find them. That's about a third. Uh, uh, there. Another third, by the way, is vessel cases. Uh, uh, cases of uh, vessels coming into the ports of the United States, east and west coast, uh, uh, that before they arrive, they dump things uh, 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 into the ocean, and then when they come into the port, they lie about it. Uh, uh, and, and, and we're doing about a case a month, big, and we're putting people in jail. That's about another third. But clearly the area that has ramped up the most during this administration I set goals in my own time coming in as Assistant Attorney General uh, is wildlife crime. Uh, and, and we can do that uh, because we have the uh, uh, great support of the administration, but we also have wonderful investigators uh, out of the Fish and Wildlife Service who, who are the people putting together the cases uh, uh, that we have uh, and bring. So without question, we have significantly brought our cases uh, up uh, uh, in a variety of ways, uh, and I want to focus I'm going to focus on Lacey Act cases. Lacey Act is like the oldest of the, well, uh, of the wildlife uh, uh, statutes. It's, it's a powerful statute and allows us in selected cases to actually uh, take into account violations of host country laws. Uh, there has to be a tie into the United States, but we can do that. Uh, and uh, it is important to us to have that ability. Uh, and it's true in a variety, it's true not just in animals, it's also true in lumber, which I'll come to, and even uh, uh, endangered plants. All right, two cases, and I picked those because I thought they would illustrate uh, two aspects of what we're doing and, uh, uh, and also give me a connection to Asia. Uh, 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 the first one is called uh, the, the Leo Antiques uh, Dealer uh, uh, case. This is part of Operation Crash. Uh, uh, there are antique houses across the uh, United States. We were looking at that. We brought cases involving uh, uh, antique uh, uh, cases. That does not necessarily mean uh, that the antique area or the antique company is doing something themselves, but uh, 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 they can be taken advantage of. And in this case, uh, uh, somebody running a Chinese business was coming into the United States, uh, uh, holding themselves off as an antique dealer, and then collecting uh, 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 some of it online, things called libation cups. Uh, a libation cup is a rhino horn. Anytime you hear the word lino cup, li uh, rhino cup, think dead rhinoceros, because that's what it means. Because you kill them in order to get the horn, and then you shape the horn uh, into a cup, and then you ship them to places like China where they're extraordinarily valuable uh, 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 there and, and make a lot of money. Uh, but in order to do that, you have to have permits, you have to have licenses, uh, and it helps really not to lie about any of that. Uh, 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 this person did all the things wrong. Uh, they picked it up illegally, they lied about it, they shipped it without permits. So what they got for that uh, uh, was uh, um, getting money back, you know, so we want to take, in one of our goals, or one of, is, our mantra is take profit out of illegal activity, so $1 million, $1 million returning to us, over 300 pieces of ivory, so we were talking about rhino horns, but when the search of his apartment occurred, there was over 300 parts of ivory, and then he went to jail for two years uh, 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 there. So that is my first example, but it was part of Operation Crash. Uh, it was part of the rhino horn we'll look at, which is still going on uh, there. Some years ago, the Lacey Act, again, a very powerful act, uh, uh, very important to us, was amended uh, to pick up uh, uh, illegal lumbering uh, uh, there, which is extremely important uh, uh, because these are wood force. Uh, and so it's important because they also can be uh, uh, endangered. But they're also right now in a world where we're concerned about carbon. Uh, those forests are carbon sinks. Uh, and also, in, in a case I'm going to tell you about called lumber liquidators, they're also habitat. So for all of those reasons, that was a very important change uh, and again allows us to prosecute 
uh, in certain cases. And I'm going to tell you about the case called Lumber Liquidators. It was on 60 Minutes. You can still see uh, a rerun of 60 Minutes if you want to uh, 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 there. Uh, but it was the illegal harvesting uh, in Siberia uh, uh, of, uh, 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 in this case, a protected uh, 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 trees, uh, uh, transshipped to Germany, recoded them because Germany is thought of as a very good place and a very law observant place, and then brought into uh, the United States. And so there was a, uh, it, it was illegal as it was picked up, but it was also illegal in how it was in fact uh, uh, brought to us, and it went on for quite a while. Uh, 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 there. Uh, and, and so, uh, and this was one we actually did uh, uh, with uh, uh, Customs. Customs was very much involved, a great player, Department of Homeland Security, Fish and Wildlife uh, 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 Service there. But when you're looking at that and we're talking about, let me go why it's important. There in Siberia is the home of two endangered species. Uh, uh, the Siberian, uh, 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 excuse me, the uh, Siberian tiger, tiger, of which there's only 450 left. Uh, in the wilds, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the amber leopard, of which there's only about 50 left in the wilds, and that was a habitat uh, 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 for them. So that by itself, right, uh, uh, would be uh, 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 worth doing. Uh, but the second part, of course, is it violated that host country's uh, uh, laws, and it violated our laws as you brought into the United States, and it was destroying uh, 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 timber. So what happened there? Uh, it was, in fact, uh, 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 the largest. Uh, 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 penalty in the history of the Lacey Act, $13 million. Uh, uh, the company, it was a company, Lumber Liquidators, then goes on a criminal prosecution, uh, excuse me, a criminal uh, probation uh, 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 for a number uh, of years. Uh, the National Geographic magazine, when they were talking about what happened the last 12 months, one of the most significant acts uh, uh, in that, uh, in, in uh, illegal trafficking, uh, picked the Lacey Act uh, because it was a felony, because of the huge uh, a penalty that they received, and because a signal is sent throughout the world uh, that we're very serious uh, about this type of uh, uh, actions. So what did I do? I talked to you just a little bit about what the Environment Division does, uh, 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 and you heard one aspect of that is our enforcement of wildlife trafficking. Uh, I talked to you just a little bit about uh, what the administration is doing with a task force uh, 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 that's actually quite important, uh, uh, and how it's working on both demand reduction, uh, uh, cooperation, and enforcement. Uh, our capacity building efforts, and then singling out of the dozens and dozens of cases, uh, two more recent ones, uh, 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 one uh, going to China, the libation cups, which you'll now associate with rhino horns, uh, and now a lumber uh, 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 case uh, because of its significant impact on habitat uh, and the rule of law. Uh, I've enjoyed talking to you, and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deliva. Um, oh, sorry. Not that. Thank you, Mr. Cruden. I got it kind of caught up right there. Uh, our next speaker is actually Charles Deliva, and he is the lead counsel for the World Bank's um, Environmental and International Law Unit. Uh, throughout his career, he's worked all throughout the world, specializing specifically in um, environmental issues green finance, as well as implementing international and multilateral environmental agreements, as well as national laws um, in countries throughout the world. Um, also, in addition to being lead counsel for the unit, he is also an adjunct professor at the George Washington University of Law. It's an honor to be here uh, with Bob Dreher, John Cruden, and uh, uh, the head of the World Customs Organization with whom we're, we are a, a close partner, and uh, we'll talk about some of our partnership activities. And um, uh, let me say that be, uh, I've worked at the World Bank for more than the last 20 years, but prior to that I had the honor to work at, at the Justice Department. Um, uh, and for uh, and John Cruden. And one of the things that the Justice Department enabled me to do is 
Um, I took a year um, off of my career working as a lawyer in the United States to go work for the United Nations Environment Program in, in Nairobi. That was in 1989. Um, and uh, I had always wanted the chance to uh, live and explore in Africa. And one of the first weekends that I was there, I, I went on a what I thought was a typical safari to Samburu National Park. And a Canadian friend of mine had a had a good Jeep, and he said, let's, uh, let, let's go off-road, let's explore Samburu. So as we were going um, off beaten path, which was quite exciting, uh, I saw what I thought looked like an elephant sleep. Looks like there's pretty large elephant. Looks like there's pretty large elephant right over to the left there. We looked a little closer, and you could see white stains on the back of the elephant, which were then a sheer clear sign that uh, there had been vultures there. So we pulled around just a little bit, and the entire face had been sawed off with chainsaws. And that was my first uh, experience of wildlife in, in Samburu National Park. It wasn't that long after, um, at the UNEP compound in Gigiri, when President Moy, uh, because of the, the crisis in dealing with uh, elephant poaching, set fire uh, to a large uh, stockpile of, of ivory as a, as a statement that Kenya uh, would not in any way countenance uh, the, you know, the illegal trafficking in, in ivory. Um, and when I got back to Washington and eventually I went on to the World Bank in, in 1992, this notion of dealing with wildlife crime um, was something that was very far. And the, Wor the World Bank was only beginning really to look at environmental issues around the time of the Rio summit. And, and the story, I think, behind that and the story behind international agencies, whether it's World Customs Organization, the World Bank, being slow to act at something that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Justice Department have been doing for so many years with the, la the through the Lacey Act type uh, uh, prosecutions and activity is that a lot of international agencies, especially something like the World Bank, has the role of dealing with poverty and economic growth. And so when in environmental professionals started to populate the ranks of, of the World Bank and started to talk about this issue, very often the reaction at the time was, what does this have to do with the World Bank? Why should we be involved uh, in this kind of activity? What I think happened is connection between um, economics and wildlife crime, environmental crime. And the World Bank has now decided to take on a role in trying to use our convening part, power to generate the kind of political will amongst different ministries that have relationships with us in, uh, in range states. And so we see our role as helping develop political will to act on an issue that's not always at the top of the agenda of, of uh, developing country finance ministries, bringing financial resources to the table, helping build capacity, and then helping to develop partnerships. I'm going to talk about some of those things. From an international standpoint, we're the largest international agency providing resources. We've, been, uh, we've got current commitments in the range of about uh, $300 million. And a, total portfolio in the biodiversity realm of, of over a billion dollars. So we are providing uh, some serious money. And one of the interesting aspects about this, again, uh, a new development for an international financial institution that has in its charter the statement that we cannot look at anything unless it has an economic consideration. One of the, one of the issues that came to fore for us is understanding the connection between wildlife crime and economic harm, the economic impact of, of, wildlife, uh, of wildlife crime. This has also, um, uh, again, since it's sort of the international side of the, of the, of the panel, um, I think borne fruit in um, the recent uh, decision in 2015 of the United Nations General Assembly to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. These are the goals that the international community has agreed are essential for the world community to have 
from now, 20, from 2015, last year, to 2030. All governments have agreed that these are the goals that we are going to agree to. And unlike what was spelled out in earlier internationally agreed goals, there's now specific reference to wildlife trafficking in uh, the sustainable development goals, and I spell out two particular targets here. And I think one of the interesting aspects about this, again, is that the UN, which has typically come at things from very much a perspective of uh, what's at the top of the agenda for developing countries. It's, it's usually growth, it's, it's food security, it's water security. Well, in 2012, the UN Security Council actually issued a, uh, a, a declaration that um, wildlife trafficking is so wrapped up in transnational uh, crime, organized crime, that the UN Security Council said, we need to take action against, and they identified the, uh, the Lord's Resistance Army in Eastern Africa that they saw as carrying out their organized crime, their, uh, their, uh, their warlike activities, by the, the, the revenues they were generating through poaching. So this has really become also part of, of, a, of a UN uh, uh, cross-cutting uh, uh, action as well, and that's something that I think is uh, striking. In the year 2015, where you have the Sustainable Development Goals, um, there alongside the, the Paris Agreement and the, uh, the Addis Ababa Agenda for Action to deal with economic growth. Uh, this is uh, a large part of what the, is driving the discussion. The International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime is another recent development that brought together uh, agencies that in the past didn't have that much uh, uh, really to, to do on a, on a daily basis together, but um, largely uh, driven by, uh, within the World Bank by then uh, President uh, uh, Bob Zelik, who um, used to wear tiger cufflinks to, to work and had his office was, everything was a picture of great tiger, um, led us to a, a partnership, uh, an alliance, if you will, with CITES, with Interpol, UN Office of Drugs and Crime, and the World Customs Organization for each entity to use its different mandate to find ways to, uh, to fight wildlife crime. Um, this was launched in uh, 2010 in, uh, in St. Petersburg with uh, Vladimir Putin taking the stage to kick it off and talk about his, his passion, uh, as he expressed it for tigers. Um, so uh, ICWIC now uh, is um, engaged, as I said, in a lot of different activities that will uh, track and target uh, illegal trade and smuggling. Uh, and, and the World Bank's role has been really to deliver financial support for a lot of what uh, for ICWIC does. The other, uh, one of the things that ICWIC has done is go to uh, developing countries and work with the different branches of government that have a role uh, to deal uh, with wildlife crime. Uh, John Cruden mentioned the judiciary. Uh, we all know that one of the frustrations of, of rangers and prosecutors has, have often been to bring a wildlife crime to a court, to a judge who then sees, I think as Bob Dreher mentioned, may see a, a local villager who's responsible for this crime. And the first thing the judge says is, you're, you're asking me to put this man in jail for trying to feed his family because he killed an animal? There's a lot of judicial capacity building that needs to take place for judges, who at the end of the day are the ones that decide whether the crime is, is going to be uh, acted upon, to understand the reason why wildlife crime has such an impact on, on communities. And so, what, and, and so the toolkit um, looks at different elements in the strand that developing countries have in order to have a fully equipped way of, going, of addressing wildlife crime. It includes forensics. It includes uh, if there's gaps in the legislation. And one of the things that the World Bank brought, brought to this in the ICWIC consortium is that we have specialists on anti-money laundering um, uh, that can help track the money that goes often from the local organized crime grain up to international banks. And so we have ways of trying to track it 
into the banking system and then try to uh, rec recover uh, the, the stolen assets. Um, networks are uh, an increasing important uh, tool. I'm sure that uh, uh, Bob Dreyer with Fish and Wildlife Service is deeply engaged uh, in this, but one of the things that we've tried to do is have communications networks uh, so that if the, if the trade is going from Asia uh, into uh, the US, the North America, or if it's going from Central America to, to Asia, there's a way to communicate the information. And especially Interpol has had a very major role in, in helping track this information. One of the most recent examples we have of this was we provide satellite uh, and tracking data uh, to Madagascar as part of what was really a, a forest uh, loan to, uh, to deal with uh, their forest program, uh, especially because of rosewood, which is a CITES species that's been illegally harvested. Data found a, a vessel that left Madagascar stopping in Hong Kong on its way to mainland China. In Hong Kong, the customs officials went on board, examined a, a permit that was issued as a CITES permit from Tanzania, and realized that it was a, a false permit, and in the hold of the ship were 7,000 uh, uh, logs of rosewood. And so that sort of combination of the customs organization, the Hong Kong uh, 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 officers, the Madagascar officials and, uh, and ICWIC and Interpol were able to track and, uh, and seize, this, uh, seize this vessel. So again, you know, for the bank, what we've identified is $70 billion a year worth of damage to developing countries because of wildlife crime. That uh, it's not only uh, impeding development, but it's also preventing natural resource businesses from going, uh, from having a normal chain of, of business. And uh, we've been working in West Africa with the US government to deal with uh, illegal fishing. Um, I'll mention that again, I wanted to talk about, or just mention in the Amazon, we've been working. Those of you who are interested in looking at the latest data for using global satellite imagery to track illegal fishing, um, this project has used data from the University of Maryland uh, Geographic uh, Sensing Service to give uh, almost real life uh, time down to very, very local areas to understand if uh, timber is being extracted from a, legally, uh, from a legal harvest area or not. That information, and, and this is one of the new developments, that information which used to just sit with the satellite uh, 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 receiver can now be uh, directly connected to agencies like Embrapa in Brazil, the local prosecutor, who can then take that and use it as evidence in, in their prosecution. I mentioned uh, fisheries. Um, here, the damage was double. Not only were West African communities losing uh, income, but the same communities uh, we're, we're using fishing as a major protein source, subsistence uh, livelihood. Uh, one of the lawyers in my office uh, went to Liberia and they revised the Liberian uh, fisheries code to have uh, the exclusive economic zone ex extended and part of the fishing regulation. They increased the penalties. They did it in a way so that it was consistent with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea articles that, that deal with seizure of illegal fishing. So it was consistent with UNCLOS and, and that, was a, that was important for us. And then they see, they've been seizing vessels that have been illegally fishing within uh, their EEZ and they set up uh, change in the legislation so that if the, the fines, the new fines that they could connect could go back into uh, the fishing revenue and the fishing uh, communities. So this is a new kind of way of using legislation to support um, uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, harvesting of, of the resource. We've been working a lot with wildlife enforcement networks. I mentioned uh, a group of them before, but ASEAN Wildlife Enforcement Network has been receiving support from the World Bank. Uh, 
the South Asia Wildlife Enforcement Network as well, including uh, using, um, providing them with equipment so that in Nepal, in Bhutan, and in India, they have been giving uh, tracking devices for tigers. And last year, Nepal uh, was able to say for the first time their tiger population actually increased. They say that this, these tracking devices have been able to rapidly both identify uh, potential poachers and keep poachers out. And then the last thing I want to mention, uh, along with thank you, is I think one challenge we have, and I think, again, I want to go back to what uh, uh, Bob Dreyer mentioned before, is dealing with the poor, because that's really, at the end of the day, that's the bank's, the bank's main role is to deal with the poor. The thing that we have to be able to do is not to make protection of the wildlife a wedge for the poor. So one of the obligations of the bank is to look at really a whole landscape in which the wildlife live. Um, and in order for them to sustain themselves, provide incentives, either through ecotourism or other kinds of um, sustainable uh, management of the wildlife so that uh, you don't breed this, this notion that for the poor, the best way to survive is to harvest uh, this uh, valuable resource. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Deliva, for joining us today. Our next speaker is Dr. Cuneo uh, Mikuria. He is the Secretary General of the World's Customs Organization. Um, in that role, he provides executive leadership and uh, direction building for uh, customs partners the trading um, routes. So Dr. Um, the trading um, routes. So Dr. Mikuria will be presenting now. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for your introduction. Um, World Customs Organization is an intergovernmental organization uh, composed of 180 um, customs around the world, and uh, together we process 98% of world trade. And as such, um, we uh, well uh, provide uh, um, standards uh, for custom procedures, and uh, we provide a platform for international cooperation. And also, uh, we provide uh, uh, capacity building assistance uh, to our members. Well, uh, customs law uh, traditionally, uh, well, classically, was revenue collection at the borders. But nowadays, uh, um, our mission has uh, evolved uh, substantially. And uh, it is more on uh, providing, uh, assuring uh, um, facilitation and the security of global supply chain, and um, also, uh, Revenue collection is also there, but uh, um, increasingly uh, protection of a society uh, from uh, um, illicit trade. Um, because illicit trade, uh, um, that can, um, well, uh, embrace many things. Uh, for example, very uh, traditional uh, narcotics, drug narcotics, uh, um, uh, trafficking, or cigarette smuggling, or, um, well, counterfeit trade. And uh, why all those illicit trade is there? Because uh, for organized crime, the best way, well, easiest way to make uh, illicit profit is through illicit trade. Because when the borders are there, uh, that means that the different legal system, different tradition, and different history, so uh, they can easily escape, uh, try to escape uh, this uh, kind of uh, well, uh, control on uh, illicit activities. And this is why border is very important. And uh, um, customs tries to be, um, well, um, connectivity uh, agency, meaning that borders divide, customs connect. But uh, it is only a legitimate trade that we would like to connect. And at the same time, uh, using our border uh, management uh, um, system, we would like to protect uh, um, health and safety of citizens. And now, uh, it, when it comes to wildlife, yes, um, I mentioned several other areas of illicit trade, but uh, um, fortunately, wildlife has gained importance, well, rather unfortunately. And uh, um, customs is increasingly required to uh, contribute to this uh, fight against wildlife crime. 
then uh, we uh, thought, what uh, is necessary? What is lacking? What are the gaps uh, for as far as customs is concerned uh, for this fight against wildlife crime? Uh, firstly, uh, it is the lack of awareness or prioritization. Because uh, we are part of government. Uh, therefore, unless the government uh, prioritizes uh, wildlife uh, um, area, uh, it is difficult for customs to really um, uh, uh, enter into that area. Well, um, as already explained, the uh, uh, United States has been uh, very active in this area, but this is not necessary in other parts of the world. Therefore, how we can raise awareness um, and, uh, well, uh, which should result in uh, prioritization of wildlife uh, crime is one area. Another thing is that the capacity building is lacking. Uh, because, um, well, um, uh, at the first, uh, um, already USCBP has explained about uh, um, how to target uh, cargo. But this kind of uh, technology or techniques are not necessarily there. Uh, so uh, how to train customs officers and build up capacity uh, to uh, control uh, those illicit trade was um, another thing that we have to do. And then uh, other areas of uh, our concern is the lack of collaboration at the borders. Because, um, um, well, customs, of course, uh, uh, should uh, um, uh, control at the borders, but uh, and seizing good is, goods is one thing. But uh, um, after that, uh, they need to uh, link it to criminal investigation and uh, get to the consequences of more um, arrests. And uh, of course, uh, uh, that uh, consequence is very much important. And especially uh, judicial cooperation is necessary. But um, uh, quite often, uh, already um, were stated by my previous speakers, there are quite often uh, frustration uh, in this respect. Even if customs make a huge seizure, what, what, uh, what is the next stage? It's, it's quite often lacking. And also, we need um, cooperation from business, because uh, those are the business that are doing business or transport sector. How can they contribute to this fight against uh, illicit um, trade is um, another important area. With this in mind, um, we started, because uh, customs people are very pragmatic, therefore uh, we started uh, uh, one, with one um, uh, program called Gaping. Gaping means um, uh, great apes and uh, integrity, because integrity is also an important uh, um, uh, function. And uh, um, that Gaping program covers first source countries. Uh, we uh, targeted source countries of um, African countries. And since 2009, we started uh, this uh, program, and uh, we provided the first uh, um, uh, risk management technique and how to detain those goods and how to uh, identify those goods by using, uh, for example, X-ray machine, etc. And uh, we uh, invited them to uh, well, developed countries to see how uh, developed countries are doing uh, those uh, um, um, uh, functions. And um, also, awareness raising is important. And uh, connect the customs officers to well, other uh, law enforcement agencies and trade. And so that kind of education uh, has been there. And uh, um, well, uh, with that, uh, um, they started to uh, um, seize uh, uh, those uh, uh, wildlife uh, um, um, uh, goods. Uh, uh, that is uh, good. But uh, and at the same time, uh, we see that, uh, well, we need more awareness and prioritization by customs. And at the same time, uh, we did a global survey uh, to our members. How do you, pri what is the priority of uh, this um, wildlife uh, um, crime? Of course, uh, they say, um, as understandably, they said, well, oh, first priority is, of course, revenue. And uh, um, then uh, they say, um, uh, yes, they want to do more in, in this area of wildlife, but then uh, wildlife protection, but uh, um, uh, they don't have necessarily uh, resources from the government or support from the government. 
Therefore, uh, in 2014, at the WCO and the conference, annual conference, all 180 um, heads of customs there, we uh, adopted a declaration that we customs will prioritize this uh, wildlife protection. So uh, this is uh, awareness raising and also as a result of this uh, um, seizure records um, that has made a very good publicity in African countries. And they started, uh, for example, um, well, uh, customs officers started to go to other countries to say that, well, this is what you can do that. And um, our method is more on train the trainer and uh, um, then uh, expand those uh, uh, technology and the techniques uh, by African country um, uh, customs officers because ownership approach is very important. Uh, it is not in position by developed countries. Uh, and um, in that way, uh, uh, we got more um, support uh, from uh, donor countries as well. Um, Gaping started with Sweden support, but now uh, we uh, enlarged to, uh, to another operation called INAMA, which gets support from United States, uh, Germany, and uh, CITES uh, as well. So uh, that is uh, good. and. Uh, um, uh, recently, uh, USCBP is now training uh, um, canine dogs, uh, which can smell the horns and tusks, and they donate to Kenya. Uh, so this is a, a very good uh, uh, well, development uh, for the cooperation. And then um, after this uh, success story, we thought that, uh, wait a minute, but uh, we have to do more. For example, um, more uh, we did in Africa, but we have to involve Asia and other parts of the world. And there, um, uh, well, World Bank representative talked about uh, um, international consortium of um, well, combating wildlife crime, and uh, um, under that, uh, and they support. Um, with that support, we uh, did an operation code named Cobra. And uh, in 2013, 14, 15, every year, we did a huge seizure and hundreds of arrests. And what is good is that now we include um, Asian countries. So even in China, there are huge seizure and arrest. So uh, that is uh, very good. And uh, um, we have to continue. Of course, it's not uh, the arrest is not only in Asia, but the US, EU uh, uh, still uh, there. So it's uh, really a global uh, problem. And then um, another step is that, OK, oh, okay. so this is good. And we have to put uh, customs police and investigator and the judicial authority more closely. Uh, therefore, uh, as was explained, the uh, U.S. has a uh, well, strong network. Therefore, uh, we asked to talk, work together in Latin America. And this is the operation Fly Away. Uh, and uh, um, uh, we helped uh, together with the U.S. criminal investigation in Peru and uh, resulted in arrest of 39 people. So that's good. And in that way, we uh, made the vi we visualized that, uh, well, those seizures of um, uh, wildlife should uh, result in uh, more uh, consequences, um, well, um, arrest and destruction of this illicit supply chain. Of course, we are uh, aware that, uh, well, most of the time we are talking about, uh, um, well, beautiful tigers, etc. but uh, illegal logging is also problematic. Therefore, um, uh, in, well, uh, we uh, do some um, um, operations uh, to start in Amazon area that, uh, well, um, in Amazon, many uh, illegal logging are there. They are destined not only to U.S., but uh, um, um, Asia as well. So uh, we uh, did that operation to uh, pay attention not only to those uh, um, well animals, but the plant uh, is also important. And um, uh, in terms of cooperation, um, so it, it is more on law enforcement agencies, but then um, uh, cooperation is necessary, necessary with uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, well, um, at the second part, uh, um, while the Conservation Society will speak, but then uh, we have recently concluded the MOU. And uh, um, with them, uh, we, uh, uh, we worked uh, with the UK Royal Foundation and uh, 
this is uh, well, Luke Royal uh, family wants to do something to, to contribute. Okay, uh, we will help you. And uh, um, now we are talking to airline companies, uh, shipping companies, and uh, um, well, express uh, um, um, con uh, ca carriers, uh, that couriers. That uh, why not? You uh, transport people. You can have zero tolerance policy. Uh, that you tr you try to make sure that wildlife is not incorporated in in your in your um, well uh, consignment. And um, this is what we we are trying now to um, get uh, uh, commitment from them. Um, you might have noticed that some airline companies started to paint uh, with lions and. Uh, um, uh, 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 and uh, rhinoceros or uh, elephants. So <laughs> this is a uh, kind of publicity, but uh, this kind of uh, well, corporate responsibility is necessary. So uh, that is the way uh, we are doing. And uh, um, we have uh, um, information network. Um, uh, it is called Embryon Net, and uh, um, yeah, it, it's, it, it is usually uh, within customs, but we open it to, uh, not only the police, um, but uh, um, those uh, who are in, interested in um, environmental area uh, that we can share more information, best practice, and then uh, we can inspire ourselves. Uh, those are the areas that uh, we can uh, do more uh, in the future. So uh, this uh, well, fight um, and uh, this collaboration has um, well, gained uh, really uh, importance in, in the past uh, five years uh, internationally. And uh, well, it has just started, but uh, we have to do more because there are more to do uh, for, uh, for combating inter international wildlife crime. Thank you very much. Thank you again for everyone. Um, we will be starting a short Q&A session. Uh, we'll be opening up the floor to contributors here at the uh, conference. But I guess I think I'm going to start off with, with my own question. Um, we talked about earlier how demand is what's really driving the purchasing power. I mean, the ability of these poachers to, to get new weapons, to expand their trade, and to really power this, this drive for illicit goods. Um, in the US, uh, it was mentioned that we're the second largest market. So first, has the rise of, rise of Chinese discretionary income impacted the demand here in the U.S., the supply here in the U.S., I guess is a better word for it? And uh, second, how, how, what, what is the best solution? What do you see as a solution to curbing demand um, nationally? I'll take the first stab at that. Um, so, you know, the, the sort of the, the rise in uh, um, the market for illegal wildlife products has led to increasing involvement uh, in America of these things. We we find uh, John has, has uh, cases where we have found people coming in from international criminal syndicates into the United States to do things like buy rhino heads that are on you know hunt club walls, and then they ship the rhino horn to, to Asia. Um, American citizens are involved in, in this. Um, I don't know that it is. Well, I mean, we still have a pretty strong market in the United States for ivory, for example. I mean, it, it's, it's diminished somewhat from the last survey that was done, but you know, you can find a lot of um, almost certainly illegally sourced ivory available for sale in any major city, um, particularly in, in San Francisco and New York City. New York City, New York has just passed uh, last year a statute that banned uh, the sale of ivory. So what can we do in the United States? Well, one of the things that we are doing is uh, we're about to finalize a regulation which will make it um, not entirely close uh, the sale of domestic ivory within the United States, but almost. Um, and I say almost because the Endangered Species Act has an exception for antiques, uh, which are defined as articles that are 100 years old or more. Uh, and so there are ivory articles that will qualify as antiques and which we cannot regulate under the Endangered Species Act. Um, but the burden of proof will be on people to show that they, in fact, have evidence that the, the ivory is authentic and is an authentic antique. Um, a lot of the articles, a lot of the, the ways people are trying to bring blood ivory into the channels of commerce and pass it off will dry up because there, there won't be the ability to sell um, ivory that it looks like it's old but, in fact, is recent or tea stained, that kind of stuff. Um, and you know, it's, that's one thing we can try to do. The other thing we can try to do is change consumer awareness, which is huge. 
Uh, in the United States, there are going to be uh, demand-side campaigns, just as there are now quite successful ones in China and in Vietnam to awaken people to uh, um, the costs of these practices. Um, a lot of people in China don't know that, that ivory comes from dead elephants. They think that elephants shed their tusks like, we, uh, like they shed teeth or something. Um, they don't know that rhino horn uh, comes from a dead animal. Um, and so educating them both that, uh, that these objects, uh, these items don't have inherent value and that, um, that they lead to the killing of wildlife is a really crucial part of what we can try to do around the world and here in the United States. Yeah, I would only add to that, uh, uh, again, I had the opportunity uh, to talk to Chinese leaders uh, when they were uh, here visiting, uh, who are all, who are you know, admittedly, you know, these are, you know, sort of government to government conversations, challenged as well. You know, they're saying there's a whole uh, um, part of their culture uh, that values ivory uh, as an indicia of wealth. And, and as you walk into a rich China's home, he might have an entire dust, uh, entire tusk over the doorway indicating wealth. Uh, 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 there, and that's been going on for uh, you know, many years. So their challenge is, of course, how do you turn that around uh, as well? But, uh, but us, we, we also have that challenge. And we're talking narrowly uh, today because uh, of things like tusks uh, and rhino horns, but the United States is also uh, a demand country for reptiles and uh, 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 bird trafficking. Uh, and, uh, and we need to do better. We need to do better in terms of uh, education. Uh, the uh, regulation that Bobby <coughs> talked about would be enormously important. And I would, because I'm a prosecutor, point out that if you're in jail, it's really hard to be a good demand uh, for illegal wildlife. I'd like to ask a question about um, who the buyers are in the United States that are creating and driving this demand, and what form of these items are they seeking the most? Uh, uh, you gave the example of China as, as to the sign of wealth with a whole uh, tusk, um, but then there was the example about it being ground up uh, for other purposes. So in the United States, what's the most common demand, and who are these people of wealth? <laughs> it seems. Well, so, you know, the United States, I, I said it's the second largest market for legal and illegal wildlife together. There's no really um, good data that indicates how big our market really is for illegal wildlife, but we know it's really large for some things. It's not, I don't think, particularly large for ivory or for rhino horn. People aren't, aren't importing those things. Now, we do have, um, we do have, uh, um, communities that have traditional ties to Asian culture, and they may share some of the same sort of traditional values for medicinal purposes or for status and wealth that the Asian populations um, share. So there is some market for it. We have a huge market for, among other things, you know, reptiles, amphibians, birds. Uh, we're the, the largest demand for illegally sourced parrots and other kinds of birds in the world. Um, and a lot of that is not rich people. A lot of that is, is ordinary people who don't even understand that a pet store that may be selling them a parrot, that the parrot was illegally sourced. Um, so we have a big complicity, and it's pretty widespread in the United States in terms of not really knowing whether we are having legally sourced wildlife products. And of course, there are there are legitimate wildlife products. I'm not saying you know, um, but if we can get things like this, uh, the the Wildlife Trafficking Alliance, which includes apparel companies that that sell you know, high-end uh, fashion. We get jewelry companies um, to make both to certify that, that they have taken every step necessary to ensure that their chains of commerce are legally sourced, but also to, to educate the, the, the public to, to ask. When you go into a store, ask where this was sourced. Is it legally sourced? Now, that will all help raise uh, consumer awareness. One element I also wanted to touch on is we're, what makes wildlife crime different is that on one hand we want to stop crime, but there's also the, the protection element of, of the wildlife, which you don't, I think, have in most other uh, criminal kind of activities. And one of the problems I think we have is that um, 
in a lot of the cases, the loss of wildlife is because of poor land use or failure to, uh, to deal with population growth, uh, something that maybe we don't talk about enough. But one of the classic early examples of this the, uh, for learning, uh, lessons learned for the World Bank was the India Eco Development Project in the Western Ghats where the tiger population was in very close proximity to local population. And the tigers were hungry. And the local population uh, saw them not as this iconic species. And this happens with elephants quite often in some of the urban, more urbanizing areas of, of Africa. The UAP compound I talked about used to have elephants on it. Now there are, there's nothing anywhere near Gigiri. Uh, no elephants are, are near. And so um, we need to find ways of, of allowing wildlife to also uh, coexist with uh, local communities. And in the eco-development project, in some cases, they were able to develop ecotourism, where the poachers found a livelihood by uh, the tiger uh, tourism trade. In some cases, it doesn't work. So I think this is one of the real challenges of coming up with new ad adaptable local land use laws and, and practices where you know revenue will go back to communities and it's not pilfered off. I mean, one thing we didn't talk about that much, and, and it underlies everything, is really there's corruption, right? So in the past, um, communities just felt like, oh, these are the rich developers or the rich tourists or, you know, they come in and they bring in wealthy people from the north, what's in it for us? And I think we're trying to change that paradigm. I'm sure uh, on our next panel, the uh, panelists will speak about that, but I think we really have to keep that in mind. I will add to that just one thing, and John, I'm sorry, I know you okay. but one thing just to, you know, there's been a lot of controversy about sport hunting since Cecil the Lion. Uh, and sport hunting for people who are, who are primarily wildlife conservationists, you know, raises pretty serious, profound questions. What, why are we allowing trophy hunting of, of these iconic animals? Um, trophy import, I mean, trophy fees, the permit fees, uh, make up most of the revenue for the wildlife agencies in Africa. Not the really wealthy societies like South Africa, but for a lot of these societies, um, it's the only means of revenue that the local community can get. For, I mean, for actually tolerating the presence of wildlife. If an elephant comes into your garden and destroys a year's worth of crops, um, you know, you're going to poison the elephant. And, and that's just going to happen unless there's a way to make you feel like the elephant is a resource and that you have a stake in its future. So hunting is it's not by, by any means the only means. Phototourism is also really, really um, a, a hopeful resource. But there are parts of Africa where there isn't the infrastructure to support tourism. Um, and hunters are, are pretty willing to go almost anywhere. Uh, so anyway, I just mentioned that because it, it is a two-edged sword. I mean, hunting can actually have great benefits for wildlife conservation if it's properly administered and if it gives benefits to communities. And one thing just to add in terms of the complexity of your question about U.S. demand versus demand outside the United States. Uh, uh, and, and one thing we haven't really talked about, but would not surprise any of you, if you look at criminal conduct right now, whether or not it's drugs, prosecution, national security issues, you know that the Internet plays a now substantial role. Uh, in that case that I told you where they were uh, 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 sending libation horns uh, uh, to China by violating laws and lying, lying about that, uh, a substantial number of that was brought off the Internet. And so that just complicates where things are and, and how things, and the demand entity. Uh, of uh, uh, all of that, uh, and without question, we're looking at that, but that's an, another whole uh, 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 world of criminality that we're getting into. Yes, uh, we heard very much about how complex this issue is, and the customs tries to give a very practical um, uh, uh, approach. Uh, if you go to airports, quite often you see that um, be careful. You don't have, uh, you can't bring back those uh, goods, wildlife goods. And uh, um, uh, in one case uh, in the Netherlands, I saw that uh, well, there are many uh, those uh, um, uh, publicity, but uh, they say that nowadays there is an app 
yeah. that uh, well when tourists you go to the countries and uh, you see beautiful uh, things that they want to buy but wait a minute is it really sightest thing or not yeah. then yeah. they take picture and uh, um, upload and then within one day usually yeah. Uh, they get the answer that uh, don't buy it. This yeah, is yeah. Uh, wildlife <laughs> thing. So that kind of approach, because in the end, the consumer education is the key. Yeah. Uh, I do want to mention, by the way, that I had to pass a dog at the Amtrak station in Union Station, and I actually gave some thought to whether I was going to spend the weekend in jail. I have I have the appropriate documentation, but I could just see this guy saying, "Oh yeah, sure, and sure, you're with the Fish and Wildlife Service," you know. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, yeah, specifically you mentioned ecotourism, and the elephant villages in India come to mind where actually elephants or baby elephants are taken and tortured in order to make them submissive so that they can be next to tourists. And then to kind of tie that to awareness, a lot of times even if I do tell people about it, they, they don't think that them going to villages like this would even make a difference. So what would you do if even awareness falls on deaf ears and that doesn't even work. Uh, it's, you know, for those of us in any of the fields where we combine you know, professionalism with deep moral concern, it's really it's it's painful. Um, there are people that just don't hear and, and they willfully blind themselves to these things. I know it's got to be painful for people that care about the welfare of animals uh, to see the way they can be mistreated. Um, one of the projects that we have funded in Gabon that, that we, we met with the people while we were there is a project that's trying to develop um, the infrastructure for uh, for ecotourism in parts of Gabon that are really totally wild at this point um, in order to bring people in to see gorillas in the wild. And Gabon has a population of gorillas. Um, and what they're trying to do is to gradually habituate gorillas by, by building sort of wooden elevated platforms and walkways into the parts of the rainforest so that the gorillas will tolerate the presence of human beings but it's carefully controlled. And you think about that, there's a trade-off there, you know. I mean, the gorillas are losing a little bit of their of their wildness because they're they're coming becoming accustomed to human beings. On the other hand, there is no source of funding to support the gorillas in the wild except to try to develop some kind of uh, uh, infrastructure for ecotourism. So it's a that that at least they're not torturing them and not trading them, they're not gonna be riding gorillas, you know, that kind of thing. But you know, it, it does you do worry. I mean that how you what kind of um, compromises you have to make in order to make wildlife sustainable. Yeah. Um, we'll take one last question if there's any out there right now. Um, it seems like the enforcement or prosecution falls on the local country. Do you see in the future that there will be international coalition that kind of takes over this kind of enforcement and prosecution? So the question is, you know, do we somehow go into some sort of international prosecution network? And, and it is true, it's absolutely true uh, uh, that uh, uh, sovereign countries do their own prosecution. The, when I talk about the Lacey Act, it's really unusual uh, because the Lacey Act does allow us to prosecute if someone acquires, uh, uh, in this case, you know, rhinoceros horns or something in violation of the host country laws, but they have to bring in the United States. If you don't do that, we don't have jurisdiction over it. We, you know, so you, if you can commit a crime entirely within another country, we don't have uh, 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 jurisdiction over that. I don't see uh, uh, an international uh, um, prosecutorial, uh, but we are very much involved with Interpol right now. We have uh, uh, one of our lawyers is on their board of directors. They have an entire wildlife uh, group. They're very active, bringing together prosecutors, bringing together uh, uh, groups, and they really can do, particularly investigatory uh, uh, activities with the permission of the host country uh, uh, that really go beyond some of the things that we do. So that's a really positive area, but these prosecution networks and the capacity building that Bob was talking about, and I talked a little bit, is another way to get cl as close as we can uh, uh, to that uh, so that we're all using uniform standards and we're all using uniform abilities. We can share uh, uh, information. We can share laboratories. Uh, we can do all of those things, uh, and so we can uh, improve that, but we're not there yet. The only, only thing I would add to that, I think uh, John is mentioning the collaboration and what uh, I think um, Dr. Cuneo mentioned is 
from the last few years is just this rapid acceleration of international collaboration and this Liberia fishing uh, seizure I was talking about. One of the really interesting things there was that through port state control measures, Liberia contacted all of the other uh, coastal states there, told them about this vessel, and they all agreed that they wouldn't allow this vessel to come to their port. So using technology and communication, you can build a whole system of, of collaboration that you couldn't before. And, and CITES now, for example, is ramping up the possibility of using trade sanctions. So you do have like an international law hook that you can then say, OK, country X is, is not complying with CITES, and the other member states can then impose uh, sanctions. It has that capability. Well, let me just build on that, because CITES, of course, uh, is a powerful, powerful international tool. It, it, it allows you to impose sanctions based on trade and wildlife products. Um, one of the things that is sort of lesser known about the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that our, our president is, is <coughs> trying to secure the United States accession to, um, among other things, it has a really strong environmental chapter that requires all of the nations in the Pacific that, that uh, contribute to about 40 percent of world trade, um, this would be governed by this compact, um, requires them not only to comply with their obligations under CITES and other international environmental laws, but Shades of the Lacey Act, for the first time, requires them to enforce um, against the imports of products that were taken in violation of the host country's law. Mm -hmm. There's never been that obligation on other countries before, but now they're all going to have a counterpart of our Lacey <coughs> Act and allows you know member countries to enforce against each other. So if if Vietnam isn't doing it, uh, then you know the United States can protest and can actually uh, threaten them with trade sanctions. Now you know this is big stake stuff, and who knows how it will play out, but it's a, a sign of the integration of concerns <laughs> like this into the trade system where there's so much economic power that you might actually get countries to respond who might otherwise be, be resistant. I don't mean to cite out, call out Vietnam in particular. All right, great. Um, so thank you for coming today, and thank you for speaking with us. Um, we're going to have a short break right now. We'll reconvene at 3.40 p.m. for the second panel. Um, if you guys have more questions, we'll have a closing remark session and then a reception following that at 5 p.m. Feel free to come down and look at the, uh, the exhibits there. Those are just don't take them. Just don't take them. <laughs> Don't worry too much about it. I've heard I've heard lots of versions.
I still haven't to adjusted to Mac to forward. I just oh this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think if you press yeah, okay, enter. Okay. Yeah, right. We can try it. Yeah. Thank you. I figure we'll just go in the order. <laughs> All right, perhaps all right, perhaps we should uh, get started to keep this uh, show on schedule. If you could take your seats. All right. <laughs> All right, let me uh, uh, introduce our uh, second panel of the day. Uh, I'm Professor Howard Chang on the law faculty here at Penn Law School. And I'm very pleased to be introducing uh, uh, a, a terrific panel that your uh, uh, editors have put together. Um, uh, we will uh, 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 have our uh, panelists speak in the order that you see in the uh, program. Um, and uh, let me introduce our, our, our first speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Bennett. Uh, she is the Vice President of the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, and she's worked as uh, Director of the Hunting and Wildlife Trade Program uh, at, at the Society. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bennett. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Chang. Thank you very much all for coming. Thank you so much to the organizers for putting this together. And Happy Lunar New Year and best wishes for the year of the monkey. Um, so we're going to start with a primate, even if not a monkey, um, and going to talk a bit about picking up on a lot of the themes we heard in the first half um, and talking about some specifics in Southeast Asia, where I worked for about 25 years uh, on some of the legal uh, challenges facing wildlife trafficking there. Now, Southeast Asia is home to some of the world's most spectacular and diverse wildlife uh, in, on, on land and in water and in all taxonomic groups. Yet all of these species and many more are severely threatened by the illegal wildlife trade. As pets, as parts, as decorative ivory, uh, there's elephants as well of course, but I thought I'd show you the, uh, the hornbill ivory which is such a concern at the moment. 
as horns and as parts such as gill plates from the rays uh, for medicinal use as well. So all of these species are in a lot of trouble. So the region is a source of wildlife for the trade. It's also a center of demand for products from within the region and also from elsewhere. This is a picture of the big Pramuka bird market in Jakarta, which sells about one and a half million wild birds every year. Southeast Asia is also, it's both a destination and a transit region for wildlife from other regions. The ones we hear most about and we've heard about earlier today for ivory, for rhino horn, uh, things like Madagascar tortoises, uh, ex extremely endangered tortoises. One of the largest markets for them is in Bangkok, in Thailand, and also increasingly in China. So it, um, it drains wildlife from other areas. And it's also a very important transit point for wildlife coming through other regions from Africa particularly, but also things like birds and reptiles and uh, river, um, river skates and rays from Latin America uh, to go on into um, Vietnam and on into China. So it's really a center of so much of the world's wildlife trafficking one way or another. And it presents a legal and practical challenge when trade routes continually change. I mean, broadly, wildlife trafficking, it's like water going downhill. You block it somewhere, it goes somewhere else. So these were some data from CITES, from their, from their uh, elephant trade information system, of the core trade routes for large-scale ivory seizures, uh, which they were mapping from the, where seizures were going on from 2009 to 2011. But then there was pressure put on some countries to do enforcement, and so suddenly the routes change. Instead of coming out of East Africa, which were under the CITES spotlight uh, and under pressure of sanctions, uh, suddenly some of these big shipments started coming out of West Africa and then going up and through. And so this is really uh, a challenge if, um, and, uh, if it's moving around all the time. So your source point tends to be the same, your end point tends to be pretty similar, uh, but the bit in the middle moves all over the place. And each country's laws need to be robust enough to reflect this. So to be effective in protect protecting the world's wildlife against trafficking uh, around the Southeast Asia hub, laws must have provisions that protect their own native wildlife in situ, and I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute that control trade in native species, such as native pangolins, tigers, orangutans, the whole palaver, and also implement uh, conventions, especially CITES, to protect species both coming to and passing through from other countries. And legislation needs to address all points of the trade chain. We heard this earlier, we need to think about demand as well as supply. So we need good laws to protect animals in the wild, especially uh, legal protection against hunting, uh, especially for species such as this, this um, Sunda clouded leopard, uh, which is so extremely rare and uh, valuable. We need protection against trafficking. We've got to break that trade chain, uh, including against possession of protected species. Now, some laws are a bit weak on this, um, whether they're for native from outside, uh, to make life easier for law enforcement officers. Law enforcement officers, and again, I'll talk a bit more about this, they have a really hard time. Um, and if possession isn't strongly an offense, transportation fairly strongly an offense, um, you could catch me as an enforcement officer with an orangutan in the back of my car, and unless possession's an offense, you can't do anything about it. I'm not buying it, I'm not selling it, I'm not passing across an international border. So we need to have laws to uh, tackle that aspect of it as well and also to prevent stockpiling. This picture is of a freezer full of pangolins. Uh, it was confiscated in Indonesia. It was part of a shipment that was labeled to go up to Vietnam. Um, and so there are, um, this one shipment was, uh, uh, was about 20 tons of, of pangolins frozen in this freezer. Um, and so again, we need laws that make this very easily prosecutable. We also need laws to protect against buying and selling. Most countries have those in some form. In fact, all countries have that in some form for their own protected species. Uh, but one that a lot of countries don't have is to have the offering for sale. Um, 
And uh, I'm aware I'm probably the only, one of the only non-lawyers in the room here, so uh, take this with whatever a pinch of salt you need. My experience on this is working with enforcement officers on the ground to implement the laws and seeing what problems they have in doing this on the ground. Um, and one reason for this, it, there's a real enforcement problem with so many fakes in the market um, of proving uh, what something is. So I could arrest uh, you for uh, selling, ha having a little package which says it contains tiger bone, uh, and then once it gets to court, you can say it was a fake, it wasn't tiger bone at all, and my case falls apart. But if it was offering for sale, then suddenly the onus of proof is on you, not me, and it it's, uh, makes the whole thing a lot easier to take through to court. Laws also need to give appropriate legal authority to wildlife enforcement officers. This is a big problem in parts of the region. Um, lack of authority to arrest in some countries, wildlife officers don't have that, which means that if they're going on patrol somewhere, they need to take the police with them, which means it's more difficult to do a sting because you've got to let another agency know where you're going and what you're doing, and that's more opportunities for the people that you're going to know about it. If you're not armed, again, you have to take them with you. It might not be the police's uh, primary priority for the time. They might not have a budget for it. So if the wildlife officers don't have the full authority to enforce their own laws, then they find it very difficult to enforce them. Another one which is a real big problem is that they don't have authority in all locations. And urban markets are a key one where often the, uh, the law enforcement capacity in urban markets lies with the municipal authorities and not with the wildlife authorities. The laws were written at a time when wildlife crime was out there in the forest, not when it was happening in town. And so, again, municipal authorities, they're not interested in wildlife crime. They've got no, uh, no training in it. They've got no experience in it. And so that, again, is a problem and uh, where wildlife agents need to be able to get to where the wildlife crime is happening. Customs, we heard earlier about the fact that uh, in the US, customs officers can actually, uh, wildlife officers can collaborate and go into customs places. When I was working in Malaysia, wildlife officers were not allowed into customs halls. It was the jurisdiction just of the customs officers. So again, um, as wildlife crime moves out into these areas, we need to make sure that we can have the right enforcement capacity within them. And finally, penalties under the law need to be appropriate for the scale and value of the crime. Too often, wildlife crime is seen as very low risk and very high profit. And if you get caught at all, partly due to corruption, partly due to low uh, penalties, you can be out on the street the next day. It's, 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 a minor, it's a minor cost of doing business. So again, the laws need to reflect that. But the best laws are irrelevant if they're not enforced. And across the whole of the Southeast Asia region, this is a huge problem. Um, and clearly there's pockets of really good law enforcement, and, and I'll come on to those. But in general, they are big problems, partly due to lack of political will. It's not seen as a serious crime. It's not seen as a big problem. Um, often my brother, who's, uh, you know, who's, the, who's the general there, he's, he's got his orangutans in his back garden anyway. And so it's all tied in as a bit of a soft crime. And also, as we heard about earlier on, uh, corruption all along different points of the trade chain, um, which means that this is just not, um, it's not taken seriously. One of the biggest problems is lack of capacity. Wildlife enforcement staffs, and this is true the world over, this is not just Southeast Asia, this applies in New York City as well as, as, well as Southeast Asia. Staffs are generally, um, it, there's too few of them, they're under-resourced and um, some, uh, this is not New York City, but this is certainly a lot of Southeast Asia, they're poorly or inappropriately trained. A lot of wildlife divisions come under forestry, which means their training, their degree, their training, in-school training is all in forestry. It's not in wildlife. Um, and so uh, that's, a, that's another problem. Frontline stuff often lack high-level high backup. They can make an arrest. They have a car full of animals. Uh, by the end of the day, live animals that they've just confiscated, unless they have the backup, what are they supposed to do with those animals? What are they supposed to do with the case that they've just held? It's far easier for them not to do their job, because if they do their job, at the end of the day, they've got a problem, because they don't necessarily have the backup to help them take it to the next level. 
And the other thing that we heard about um, was with um, uh, World Customs and others providing help with uh, forensic and other technical support. Most countries don't yet have that. They can't prove what something is. Uh, and they don't have the, the full backup to do it. So those are all the problems that really we need to be addressing much more fully. A further challenge, uh, and this is again a, a bigger problem than just the region, is wildlife laws are often very complicated. They've often evolved over time uh, with from times where wildlife trade was, was probably a good thing, it was good for economic development, and um, so and they, they've ended up being extremely complicated, which means that for a frontline ranger, again, his day-to-day -day job is jolly difficult unless he has a fairly straightforward law that he can understand and he can implement. And one major challenge is where you get parallel legal and illegal trades of the same items because their sources are different. So, for example, this is a picture of a bear in a wildlife farm in, in a bear farm in Vietnam. Um, items from wildlife farms. It's illegal to buy bile from wild bears and paws from wild. It's it's legal to buy it if it comes from this this chap in the farm. And so, how is an enforcement officer supposed to prove the difference? Another problem is items from legal stockpiles. Um, in some countries, you have legal ivory uh, being sold either from stockpiles or as antiques. Um, and again, this makes it very difficult for a customs officer. Is this ivory that I see for sale in this shop from a stockpile or from a, a, a fresh illegal source? The permit in front of it is probably fake anyway, so how am I as an enforcement officer supposed to know? Uh, and there's no way really he can. A couple of other local examples within the region. In Thailand, uh, you have laws allowing for sales of ivory from domestic elephants, and that, of course, allows laundering from wild elephants. They're trying to close that loophole now. They're under very strong pressure from CITES to do it, uh, but that involves registering uh, domestic sources and that sort of thing, which, again, is very complicated, and it makes an enforcement officer's life nigh on impossible. Another issue is where some of, the, some of the problems and confusion is coming from outside the region, feeding into the region. So, for example, a big problem at the moment is that CITES is, uh, the CITES authorities in Central African Republic are issuing permits for uh, African grey parrots saying they're captive bred. There are no captive bred facilities in Central African Republic. It's a way of laundering wild parrots into the trade, but by the time they get to Singapore, they have a legal CITES permit saying that this is a, wild, uh, a captive bred parrot, which therefore can legally be sold. So it's this confusion between legal and illegal for some of these endangered species, which is a real problem. And this means our poor enforcement officer, here he is, how's he supposed to know whether this bit of ivory is legal or illegal? It's very easy to launder illegal goods in as legal. And clearly opportunities for corruption are huge if you've got these parallel trades. Whereas if you've just got a clear, this is legal for this species and it's not legal for this species, if they're easy to identify and there's lots of good tools for that now, it makes life much easier for this fellow in the middle here. So to control wildlife trafficking, we need laws that address the whole chain from source to markets to protect native species from the region and also species from other regions that are simple and unambiguous, that empower enforcement officers to be able to do their job, and that have appropriate penalties. And we also need everything else that I've talked about to be in place to allow for effective enforcement, all these training, capacity building, support systems uh, to allow this to be done. And we can succeed. In Indonesia, there's a group called the Wildlife Crimes Unit. It's funded largely by Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, they are forming intelligence networks. It's done by a combination of international NGOs, in this particular case, uh, my own one, Wildlife Conservation Society, with local NGOs, with the local media, and uh, giving support to the Indonesian government, um, getting intelligence networks going. And what they've done is map out for Sumatra where all the tiger kingpins are, gradually going through getting the evidence to arrest them, and others are now starting to say the risks are too high, that therefore we're going to go into another line of work. Um, and so uh, this is being very successful with this sort of tiger training going, trading going on within Indonesia. And we heard about the difference between arrest rates and, and prosecution rates earlier and the problem that that often has. And where these wildlife crimes units are operating in, in Indonesia at the moment, um, then we're getting these much higher uh, rates to actually taking the thing through to court. Uh, again, thanks to Fish and Wildlife Service for their strong support for this. 
and use of the media in this Indonesia has a surprisingly free press and the fact that the media track these cases through means that if it's general somebody or other who's been arrested for trafficking, um, they will track it to make sure it actually does go to court. So it reduces the opportunities for corruption. And that shows that even in countries that we think of as having fairly low background capacity with good uh, partnerships, technical support and funding, we can combat wildlife trafficking in Southeast Asia. I've just given you one example. There are others. And so we can do it so that this tiger here ends up wandering back into the forest rather than just being a pile of bones. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Um, our next speaker uh, is Marcus Asner. He's uh, a, a partner at Arnold and Porter, and he serves on the President's Advisory Council on Wildlife Trafficking. I give you Mr. Asner. All right, well, thank you very much for having me. I have to confess that uh, being back in a law school room fills me with a certain amount of fear. Um, I, I think back on when I was in law school, and uh, my memory is perhaps clouded, but I remember being very good at two things. One was gunner bingo, and the other was when I was called on saying pass. Um, so, um, but at any rate, it's, it's a pleasure being here. Um, I'm here, unlike most of the panelists today, I think they are specialized in wildlife and environmental law. I am not. I'm a litigator and I am a generalist and I came into this through a completely different approach um, or a different path. And, and I think uh, I want to talk about that a little bit because I think it, uh, it, it, it talks about one way you may think about going after these sorts of crimes. Um, from 2000 to 2009, I was a federal prosecutor in Manhattan in the Southern District of New York. Um, and what you do there is you start out doing petty crimes. You spend a year doing that, and then you spend a year doing narcotics cases. And I got my first wildlife case um, right after leaving in narcotics. And I think that actually is somewhat important. When you do narcotics cases, there's some common themes that you try and, and understand and you attack them. And the idea is to make the price of doing, the costs of doing narcotics trafficking too high so that people will exit that and do something else, either go straight or get into a less problematic crime. They have highly organized criminal net networks. They exploit corruption in borders. They will engage in money laundering, both to hide the proceeds of what they do, but also to further the crime. Um, oftentimes, they will exploit humans. Um, they'll be involved in intimidating and violence. They will try and attack, attack uh, uh, problems in the border and law enforcement. Um, oftentimes, it's a challenge to prove mens rea, mental state. And the bad guys get into narcotics not because they want you to get high. What they do is they want to get money, and it's about money. And one thing I learned about wildlife trafficking is it's exactly the same thing. They don't kill elephants because they hate elephants. They kill elephants because they want money. And the way to attack this is the way you attack narcotics trafficking. There's always going to be differences, but the key is to drive them out of this business, either put them in jail or have them do something else, either go legit or go into credit card fraud. <laughs> um, so the case I prosecuted, and, and if uh, John and Bob were not here, I would say it was the largest and most successful Lacey Act prosecution in history, but they are here, so I have to say Lumber Liquidators is now. <laughs> Uh, it's the United States versus Arnold Bengis. I'm going to use that as a case study. I'm going to talk about the investigations and prosecutions. It's a very interesting case because what it does is touch on pretty much all, all the issues that we talked about today. And it'll also f focus a little bit on some of the ideas I have and have been pressing in the Wildlife, uh, advisory, uh, wildlife Trafficking Advisory Council for uh, legal reform, ways that we can make this stronger. 
I'm going to focus a little bit on a legal case that I argued coming out of this involving restitution, which became sort of a seminal case in this area. And then I'll give you my two cents from these lessons learned about what we all might be doing, both academically, but also from policy matters, uh, to fight this a little better. OK, so narcotics, supply and demand. Wildlife trafficking, supply and demand. I think of everything in terms of supply and demand when you're talking about trade type crime. In this case, the supply side was South Africa. There were three categories of fish, West Coast rock lobster, South Coast rock lobster, Chilean sea bass. I know more about rock lobster than I could have ever dreamed to know. I know, for example, that the top one is a shallow water fish and the bottom one, the bottom lobster, is a deep water fish. And you know that because of the pigment. The top one is West Coast, the bottom one South Coast. Ask me anything during the break about rock lobster. <laughs> Um, the scheme was devastating. It was, um, we, there were a lot of studies conducted. At one point, uh, through cooperators, we knew that uh, right towards the end of the scheme, 90% of the West Coast rock lobster was illegal. South Africa commissioned a report by a company called OLRAC uh, to figure out what the cost of the damage was. They came up with two numbers. The cost to remediate the fishery, in other words, to, one way of thinking about it economically is to bribe the fishermen not to fish, would be about $46.7 million. The market price of all of the stolen fish conservatively was, over six, was about $62 million. The impact was pretty dramatic. You see the arrow pointing there. What happened was Arnold Benjus was fishing the south coast, uh, the deep water fish, uh, and the fishery was crashing pretty dramatically. The South Africans took him out in South Africa, and the fishery came back. Um, and I always thought that this was a pretty nice one. I kept on presenting this over and over again to Judge Kaplan in the Southern District. Um, how do they do it? So one of the things I always did, which always gave me uh, an advantage, probably in Gunner Bingo as well, but I started thinking of if I were a criminal, how would I do the crime? And I think that's always a useful thing when you're thinking about policy issues in law enforcement, because that will tell you where you can put your finger in the dike and stop the flooding. Um, so you're fishing way too much fish. 90% of it is illegal at one point. How do you get it to the dock? Well, you have to bribe the fisheries inspectors. You offload it at night. Um, you have to report to the to the uh, the fisheries people how much fish fish you've landed. So you have a quota. You can't say, okay, if my quota is 10,000 tons, that that night I brought in 10,000 tons because the season goes on for six months or so. You have to stretch the quota. You you report that you only brought in one ton or something like that on the first uh, landing, and so you stretch the quota. You also have to keep two separate sets of books what you've reported to the fisheries folks, and then also you have to keep internal books on what you've actually landed. Why? Well, in one of my sordid jobs when I was young, I worked on a fishing boat. And one of the things I knew by working on a fishing boat was that as a green guy on the crew, every salmon we landed was a dollar to me. And so I counted every salmon that we landed. The crew counts the fish and they get paid by the amount of fish that they land. So you need to keep two sets of books. And so you have a sheet A and a sheet B. So that's how you have to do it. One way to think about fighting crime, building cases, is where do the bad boys, guys necessarily have to leave evidence? OK, so you get the, the lobster. There's capacity to sell it in South Africa, but it's small. You've got to export it to China, and you've got to export it to the United States. So one of the things you're going to do is you're going to list the fish that you're exporting as something else. Because why would you tell the South African authorities that you're exporting so much fish? So you've got to hide that. And so you are now putting into the, the authorities a piece of paper that is false. All right. All right. Now, the demand side for my prosecution, because of the way the Lacey Act works, was the United States. They had a big operation in New York City where they did the importation and distribution. They also had a factory up in Maine. And well, how do you do it then? Well, one of the things they had to do is they had to make a decision. They've got a, 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 a container full of illegal fish. Do you tell the Americans the truth or do you lie? 
Either way, it's a decision. If you tell them the truth, then they open it up and they know it's the truth and they say, okay, it comes through. But the danger is, is that these customs guys will talk to each other and suddenly the documents are different. Or do you lie and you say the same thing that you said to the, the, to the South Africans, to the Americans? Either way, you have to make a decision. They decided U.S. Customs opens up every container and so therefore what we will do is tell the truth. What they didn't know is that U.S. Customs back then, and even today, does not open up every container, but they made a decision and they told the truth to the Americans. Um, also, money. Follow the money. All right? You have to pay for all of this. These, lo these lobster fishermen have to have extra money, and a lot of extra money. You also have extra harvesting costs because you have to tail the lobster and, and you, know, you have more electricity, you have more people working throughout the night to, to uh, package all the lobsters up to send it off for export. You have uh, extra profits. What do you do with that? And so you know that you're not going to send all the money back to South Africa and you would think, okay, well, how will it look? It looks like something like this. And the real purpose of this is to show off that I can do PowerPoint. But you see, the, the lobster comes to the United States. Some money has to come back to South Africa because you know that if you're putting on a facade that this is a real business and everything's legitimate, some money has to come back. But some money has to go elsewhere. And here we figured it's going to go to Switzerland. One of the nice things about being a federal prosecutor is you pull out a grand jury subpoena, you subpoena Citibank, and lo and behold, and there's all these wire transfers off to Switzerland and Spain. And that's exactly what happened. Okay, so the investigation and prosecutions. How did it work? How did we get them? Um, the South Africans got a tip. They started focusing in on this. They inspected a container. They found the wage records. And um, the first thing, as they were doing a raid of Help Bay Fishing Industries, which was the factory there, the main guy, Arnold Benjes, was on the phone with one of his lieutenants, who later cooperated and told me the first thing he asked for was, get the wage records out of the building. And I, of course, said, I know why he said that, because the wage records are real, the records that you paid the fishermen. Um, they grabbed the export documents, they got witnesses, and then, of course, they talked to competitors. Competitors are wonderful. They will tell you all sorts of things about you. The only best, better piece of evidence is ex-wives. Uh, that's, but th those are the two things that, as a prosecutor, you just love to have in your pocket. Uh, the United States, we had import documents. We had, um, we were able to find in the garbage a document that said conveniently sheet A and sheet B that listed out both the real and the fake. Um, in fact, it had been shredded and uh, Noah pieced it together again, it, amazingly. Uh, I found the money flow and it, as expected. It, and of course, we developed cooperating witnesses and of course, competitors in the United States are also good capitalists and are quick to throw people under the bus. Um, we did a matching project and this is where everything fell apart. We brought over all of the documents from South Africa. We put them in a warehouse and we brought in all the customs documents and put them into a warehouse in Newark. Uh, at a secure, undisclosed location that I will not tell. Uh, and, and the nice thing about the worldwide uh, container shipping industry is that containers each have a number, and those numbers are unique. And so you can find out that the container that they shipped out of South Africa is the same container that they brought into the United States, and it ain't the same type of fish. So you've got a crime. And that's how we did the case. Prosecution in South Africa. Um, it was until uh, the Zuma investigation, the largest public corruption uh, prosecution post-apartheid in South Africa. They got 14 fisheries inspectors. They seized a bunch of boats and the factory. And uh, in the United States, we arrested Arnold Benjes and four others. Um, Lacey Act was huge. Uh, he got 46 months. Um, we seized only 7.4 million, which is shy of the 11, 13 million that they got in lumber liquidators. Um, but the story continues. Um, and this was the front page of the Cape Times. All right, so at this point, this would have been a victory. But then a funny thing happened, restitution. Through a mistake, the defense and I failed to resolve the restitution issue. Who was the victim and how much were they owed? And it turned out to be an incredibly tough issue because who owns the fish? And I was talking to the professor 
earlier today, and it goes back to the whole fox, you know, the, the noxious beast, the fox thing from property. Who owns the fish? So we litigated that for the good part of a decade. Although I won on the underlying case, I lost every step of the way. And ultimately, uh, with Judge Kaplan, who got very tired of the case, and and ultimately, and this is very unusual, is we got DOJ approval to to appeal a criminal case to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And um, it turns out that under the restitution statutes, you have to, when you peel through it in this instance, it has to be property and it has to be an identifiable victim under the US federal restitution statutes. Um, Ulrich had two theories. One was the catch forfeiture. Under Roman Dutch common law, under Grotius, it turns out, which is underlies South African law, fish belong to no person. A wild fish belongs to no person. But if it's captured, it belongs to the fisherman. But if the fisherman is poaching, then the warden has the right to take the fish away from the, the, the fisherman. Um, that's still the law after the Constitution and apartheid and, and the UN law of the sea. The second thing is that while individual fish don't belong to anybody, there is an overlay of the UN law of the sea and the South African legislation post-apartheid in the Constitution. And so we said that South Africa may not have a property right in an individual lobster, but it does have a property right under a public trust doctrine to the resource as a whole. So we appealed that up, and the Court of Appeals reversed Judge Kaplan, January 2011, and it sidestepped what I thought was the more interesting public trust argument, but it said that under this logic, the moment a fisherman pulls an illegally harvested lobster out of the sea, a property right to seize that lobster is vested in the government of South Africa. Evading seizure of over-harvested lobsters thus deprives South Africa of an opportunity to sell those illegally captured lobsters at market price and retain the proceeds, representing an economic loss to South Africa. And reverse Judge Kaplan. And this became a seminal case in these circles. Um, and this was the front page of the, the Cape Times then. Uh, going forward. So takeaways on all of this. Um, they, ex they try to exploit weaknesses in local enforcement and port inspections. They try to exploit corruption. They mislabel cargo. Um, they exploit the challenges to international information sharing and cooperating. They assume that you don't talk to your counterpart. Um, they have to use money laundering, and they engage in a cost-benefit of analysis. Um, we treat it like a real crime. This is not a secondary crime. Um, you have to have transparency into what's harvested and moved around. You share information across borders. They try and take advantage of borders, so you take it away from them. You follow the money. Uh, you need uh, criminal enforcement statutes. If one thing comes out of all of this effort, if we have a Lacey Act in every country in the world, that is a win. Um, prison and monetary sanctions. And then um, restitution and compensation. One of the things that I argue in the Court of Appeals is that by putting the money back to the victim, that gives them incentives to cooperate with Bob Dreher. And that ends up being hugely important. South Africa is rich, but most of these countries aren't. Um, and so going forward, I think one of the things that we've been pressing for in the Advisory Council is to take wildlife trafficking crimes and treat them like other Title 18 crimes, where they can be a predicate for RICO, for uh, money laundering, for the Travel Act. Right now, there's a statute that's floating around that is far watered down from what I had recommended earlier coming out of our subcommittee, but it's a great first step. Um, the Lacey Act is not included that. Write your congressman or congresswoman and make sure the Lacey Act gets into that bill. Um, I would also bolster the restitution provisions. I could spend all day talking about the legal acrobatics it took to establish restitution here. And um, plainly information sharing across agencies, which I think the customs folks are focused on. And then generating cooperators. I have my own idea of that, but we could talk about that maybe during the question and answer. Um, and uh, internationally, um, what I would focus on is um, Lacey Act type statutes, as I told you before. Um, I think enhancing cooperation framework in range countries. I was uh, sent on one of my things to Masamara, which is on the northern end of, it's, it's in 
Kenya, it's a reserve, and it's not right near the Serengeti, and I is a listening thing. And I met with one of the officials there, and I asked him, how many people have you, how many poachers have you arrested in the last year? And he said something like, around 40. And I was flabbergasted. I thought, how could that be? That's great. And for me, as a former federal prosecutor, 40, you flip those guys, and, and if, if you get at least 240, then that's pretty good. But you should really be able to do even better than that. I said, what happened to all of those folks? And he said, I don't know. And what that means is that corruption is, is rampant, and they are not because they don't have the ability to compel those people to cooperate. They're just getting, they're bribing their way out. Um, Anti-corruption, obviously. Transparency from arrest to conviction, it would be huge because of what I was just talking about. And, um, and we'll talk about the rest later. Thank you. Thank you. Um, finally, we have uh, Professor uh, Anikos Wiersma, uh, Professor of Law at uh, the University of Denver. Uh, Sturm College of Law. Uh, her research focuses on international environmental law uh, with emphasis on international wildlife law, uh, species and biodiversity uh, conservation, and forest conservation. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here and thank you to the organizers, particularly to Marika for organizing such a terrific event. Uh, it's a very important issue as you've heard consistently today and it's terrific to have some attention uh, being paid to it. So I'm going to talk today about a few questions that come up when people talk about uh, bans on international trade in endangered species and their parts. And I'm going to focus on the way in which the reality often conflicts with the assumptions behind arguments that we should allow some legal trade, which has sort of been uh, beneath the, the burner, if you like, today, although Dr. Bennett referred to the problem with, with dual markets. So I'm going to do this by focusing on CITES and the role of incomplete bans and I'll explain that, and the way in which the incomplete nature of these, these trade bans can highlight or uh, exacerbate really the uncertainty of markets for these species and creates all sorts of difficulties. Um, so the title, uh, Incomplete Bans and Uncertain Markets, and uh, I, have to, I have to be the professor, so uh, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of the structure of CITES. Uh, it's more complex than I'm going to tell you, but, but at least so that we understand what we're talking about here. So a quick overview of Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. It works uh, by listing species. There are three appendices, but the two that we're most interested in are Appendix 1 and Appendix 2. So Appendix 1 listing is for all species threatened with extinction which are or may be affected by trade. And here... CITES is only concerned with international trade. That is the scope of the treaty. Uh, so what does that mean? Once a species is listed, uh, the states that are party, uh, the countries, I'm an international lawyer, so I refer to countries as states, um, have to make non-detriment findings for import and export permits. And for Appendix 1 listed species, the import permit requires that a specimen is not to be used for primarily commercial purposes. So that's why when we talk about Appendix 1 listed species, we say that there's an international trade ban for commercial purposes uh, in trading those species and parts of those species specimens. So there are around 630 species of fauna listed on Appendix 1. That includes around 300 mammals. I don't want to forget the plants, even though we're focused on uh, wildlife today. So there are about 300 listed on Appendix 1. Appendix 2 listing. This is for all species, and I'll read it out, which although not necessarily now threatened with extinction, may become so unless trade in specimens of such species is subject to strict regulation in order to avoid utilization 
incompatible with their survival. So for species who are in international trade or affected by international trade, and there's some sense that if that trade is not regulated, strictly regulated, that they may be falling into the category that would, would be Appendix 1. And B here, I've just put that up there, is for what are called look-alike species. So you have to protect them as well, because otherwise um, the other species might be uh, uh, taken. So what's the difference? Appendix 2 requires non-detriment findings for export permits, NDFs, but it doesn't require an import permit. So there is no restriction on commercial trade. And Appendix 2 listed species can be traded internationally. There are some caveats, which I'll talk about. So there are about 4,800 fauna listed on Appendix 2. That includes around 500 mammals and the plants. We mustn't forget the plants. Uh, so by comparison, remember there are about 630 fauna listed on Appendix 1, around 300 of which were mammals. Well, what does this tell us? It tells us that there are a lot of species that are being legally traded under Appendix 2. Uh, some of these are the subject of ongoing debates about whether they should be uplisted or not. Uh, there are tremendous capacity problems with the non-detriment findings. There's a lot we could say about that. Um, but we have to remember that there is legal trade under CITES. And I want to focus particularly right now, though, on some middle ground where we recognize that certain species are highly endangered, that trade is primary threat or at least one of the primary threats to those species, but there's some wiggle room in that commercial trade there. So here are some examples from CITES. We might usually think of middle ground as being a good thing. Here the middle ground is, well, I'll talk about that. Okay. So some examples, and I'll give you some, some specific species examples here. Some species listed on Appendix 1 have subpopulations that are listed on Appendix 2. And some Appendix 2 species are subject to zero export quotas. So no uh, trade allowed up front with then a few exceptions here and there. Some Appendix 2 species, for some of them, some countries are only going to allow export for certain reasons. They specify only for uh, hunting trophies, for example. And the quotas, these aren't mandated by CITES. They've become a really critical tool in CITES. States can set quotas for export for specific reasons. So again, the hunting trophies would be an example for that. We also have captive bred species, and we heard a little about this uh, from Dr. Bennett, that are not subject to the same listing restrictions. That's not to say CITES doesn't pay any attention to captive breeding operations. They do and are increasingly doing so, but at least captive bred species are distinct from the wild populations that are listed. And domestic law can add restrictions as well. Uh, it can have particular permit requirements, for example, for trophy hunters can require or even ban import of things that CITES itself, uh, the, the, the originating country may not have, have denied export, but import will be denied. So we see that um, with some hunting trophies that are being banned in the US and Australia has been active in that as well um, and, and just complete import restrictions. All right. So what does that mean? Oh, let me, oh, I'm sorry. So you've got to have some pictures. So I'm going to give you some examples here. Um, the African elephant is listed on Appendix 1, uh, except for populations of Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. But these are then subject to zero export quotas with provision for periodic sales between designated countries. And the story is actually more complicated because there's been talk about um, some kind of procedure for, for uh, ivory sales, which is, I learn might be uh, being tabled for now. But so you see there's this sort of middle ground here. Uh, rhinoceros, the white rhinoceros is listed on Appendix 1. There are populations of subspecies in South Africa and Swaziland, which are actually included in Appendix 2, and then for the exclusive purpose of allowing international trade in live animals to appropriate and acceptable 
destinations and hunting trophies. So not all commercial trade, right, but a, a, a distinct category. This actually was a bit of a problem because one of the biggest demand states for rhino horn in recent years has been Vietnam. And there was a moment uh, in time when some young Vietnamese women became particularly active in trophy hunting of rhinos. It wasn't that they had taken up this profession. They were actually prostitutes who had been hired to take advantage of this loophole. South Africa, a little shamefaced, and had to try to do something about that. And this is Cecil the Lion, um, which, of course, was the subject of a lot of media attention. Not all of the species are. I've focused on some of the most prominent ones. But, of course, is an example of where uh, this is a, a, the African lion is listed on Appendix 2 and is the subject of particular uh, quotas from different countries for particular things. <coughs> All right. So, so what does all of this mean, these incomplete bans for arguments that we should maybe allow some kind of trade? Some of those uh, allowances for trade would be trophy hunting, uh, captive bred uh, animals, uh, ranching, or sales of stockpiles as well would be another source of legal trade. Now, I'm going to just summarize some of the arguments. I'm going to be, have to speak at a level of generality uh, because all of this depends on particular studies and context. So I'm going to end up raising more questions than I answer. But that's sort of the point here. So I'm also not going to address really arguments about the ethics of whether we should be killing elephants at all. That is uh, one of the arguments that a lot of proponents of illegal trade will say, oh, you're just driven by emotion, you're driven by uh, an am animal rights ethic. And I don't want you to think I'm ignoring the ethics here, but I want to table that because there are lots of other reasons why we might question having legal trade. So a supply side argument that drives a lot of the, the push for legal trade, for le legal trade, would say, for example, the cost of black market products is very high, legalize the product, and the cost will go down. And that will drive the traders, and therefore the poachers too, out of the market. The revenue from the legalized market can be funneled either to local communities as an incentive, alternative income, for poaching, to poaching, and conservation efforts, or to governments for conservation costs. Now, I live in Colorado. They've just legalized marijuana. I'm very familiar with these arguments because they're just like the arguments for legalizing uh, drugs. But there are, of course, some important differences. So what are some of the assumptions that lie behind that argument? Well, one is that we can predict market behavior and that we can predict the behavior of the market players. So there are problems with some of these models uh, that assume perfectly competitive markets among the traders. Uh, we also, these arguments don't address the possibility of spillover. So if you are not going to be trading anymore in one species, that you would start trading in another. And we do see new threats to species that were not previously targeted, so giraffes, I think is one of the most prominent examples of that. One of the other assumptions here is that the legal product will substitute perfectly for the illegal product, and therefore there won't be a demand for illegal product. But there's a lot of that there's a lot of questions about that. So sometimes the illegally taken product might actually be cheaper to take than going through uh, the procedures of the legal market. Sometimes the very thing that makes uh, the, the animal parts valuable is the sense that they are illegal. And we also don't know whether there will be a premium then paid for the illegal uh, uh, illegally taken specimen. 
what else? What's another assumption? Well, one of the other assumptions is that we can't do anything about demand. And we've seen some examples of where uh, in recent years demand has been affected. But we also know it's a messy, complicated task because we're getting into all sorts of uh, sometimes centuries old uses. So there's a couple of things to remember here. One is we have seen changes in demand and we have seen changes in demand even where the uses were traditional. Uh, this is true of the use of, of uh, ivory in Yemen, for example. There's been some shift in demand. Some of the campaigns by Yao Ming and other prominent uh, Chinese celebrities have had an effect on certain things. But also, it's important to really locate the source of the demand because some of the biggest demand, according to a report by traffic in Vietnam, is not being driven by traditional Chinese medicine, but is being driven by new uses. Uh, consumption, conspicuous consumption, and actually advertising and marketing for rhino horn as a cancer cure, which is not a, a traditional use. So we have to do better marketing, right? Um, but it, I don't think it's true that we can assume that demand won't change. And in fact, legalizing a product can reduce the stigma of use, thereby increasing demand. And in the case of certain sales of, uh, of ivory to China, there's some evidence that uh, the carvers, the ivory carvers who had been sort of dormant have, have reawakened their uh, profession. Okay, so there are also arguments about conservation, right? That, uh, this is a way to deal with conservation. Some of the stockpiles of, of uh, ivory or rhino horn come from conservation actions, including culling. They also come from seizures and things like that. But it's questionable whether this is good conservation. It can be good conservation. And there, there are studies, and it depends on the species, it depends on the location, and it also depends on the behavior of the hunters themselves. So the willingness of the hunting groups to actually abide by internal rules about the size of a lion that can be taken, and things like that. And that gets me to sort of the next point, and this is something that was very prominent in Dr. Bennett's talk, which is what about the, the policing and the regulatory costs of having what is essentially a dual stream market. You have to deal with the possibility of laundering, which is a very real possibility that you've opened up. Whether or not Colorado, from legalizing marijuana, will ultimately profit, I think is still an open question, right? Because the amount of regulation that has had to go into creating what is a dual stream market because it's legal in the state and illegal outside the state has been huge. And all of the things that Dr. Bennett described, they don't go away when you have also a legal market. You have to do all of those things and figure out what's legal and what's illegal. The kinds of costs I think are minimized by the assumption that the market will take over. But in fact, you need to have a very robust regulatory system in order to accommodate this kind of thing. And certainly there are some views that you can't charge, if we're thinking about trophy hunting, you can't charge the hunters enough for the actual costs of policing, uh, policing the problem of a dual stream market. Now, as I said, I, my comments are very general, so some of the arguments relate specifically more to trophy hunting or to captive breeding, and I'm not suggesting that we can, in this room, take an absolute position, but what I am suggesting is that we have to think much more carefully about the answers to these questions. The last thing I want to talk about is the importance of the local communities, because that is obviously critical. And to the extent that a legal market could provide revenue and incentives to local communities, that would be wonderful. But there are 
questions there again, meaning that if you do design some kind of dual stream market, you're going to have to think very carefully about the revenue. First of all, you're going to have to make sure, if you're the government, that you have enough resources to police that dual stream market. So some of the money has to go to that. You've got to make sure that you're getting enough money to the private players in the industry. And it's not clear that the money will always go to communities that are doing conservation. And if you think about captive breeding operations, those are uh, many of those are not even situated near the location where the wildlife would be living in their habitat. So not clear any of that money actually goes towards conservation. The question of, of how we um, integrate wildlife conservation into local communities so that they are uh, protecting, and, and some are, I don't want to suggest that's not true, but so that they're interested and invested in protecting is a really difficult one. But I guess my takeaway point is that we can't rely on a, a fairly simplistic supply side economics argument to answer the question of providing incentives because it is much more complicated than that. And I think I've probably already gone out, out of time, so I'll leave you be. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Weersma. Um, uh, before we uh, open the floor to questions, I wanted to give our panelists an opportunity to, uh, 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 if they have any reactions or comments on each other's presentations, to uh, uh, to, to share them with us. Uh, are there any uh, observations you? I guess, I guess the, uh, with respect to uh, the professors, um, I, I think it is co very complicated, and and you know where where you do have. Um, dual use or um, mm -hmm. instances, usually you have a rule of law. So, I mean, the, the typical example would be, say, deer hunting in the United States. Um, you know, we have deer hunting in the United States, and I, I don't, I'm not a hunter, and I find something, you know, a little bit of gruesome about, like, having trophies. But putting all that aside, a lot of people disagree with that, and we live in a democracy. Um, but what we do have is a rule of law. And, and so while we have deer hunting, it I think it serves a good conservation purpose, and so it it, it kind of works there. You can't have that when you have local communities that are just completely lawless and corrupt. Um, the other side of it is is that you will have uh, dual streams automatically in certain categories of wildlife. Fish mm -hmm. is the main thing, really, because auto, you know every time you get wild fish, there are going to be there's going to be the potential for poaching. Um, Ivory, um, exotic species, charismatic species, I, I agree, there's just a no-brainer at this point that yeah. you just kind of have to ban it. Yeah, and I guess I should clarify, I mean, it, it, as I say, general rules aren't don't work across the board. Yeah. So when we're talking about the most iconic species um, and the species that we recognize this level of threat, the, the ivory, the rhino horn, um, there are others, of course, I think that's where we have to be really careful. Um, because the risk is, is high. Yeah, yeah and uh, again, I, I, I found both completely fascinating. I've learned a lot. Um, the, uh, in terms of the parallel legal and illegal, the, the, the things that um, you can sort of tease apart a little bit in terms of whether it's going to work or not is partly the governance system, mm -hmm. uh, which is a key one, partly the value. Mm -hmm. Fish tend to be less valuable than ivory. Mm -hmm. There are exceptions. Mm -hmm. like, uh, specimen over there, but in general, so the value of the item, because that will link strongly to um, the sort of incentives for corruption and for laundering. And the other one is the sustainability of the species, um, because some species just are very low sustainability. Elephants, they have, you know, gestation period of 22 months. They have one uh, calf for four years. Or so you can't just crank out ivory. You can crank out capybara skins, um, which are these large South American rodents. Um, they're rodents. Uh, their skins are lovely. They're very valuable. Um, uh, uh, sort of, they're, they're very, uh, they're nice, but not valuable on the same scale as, a, as, a, as, a, as an ivory tusk. 
and their own, so they're pumping out babies like the Dickens. So, um, and on the whole, if they were in places where you've got local community control of them as a resource, then the local community has got reasonable governance, they've got good incentives to do it, value per unit item is relatively low, and the, um, and the, uh, and the, um, the sustainability is, is, is pretty good. So yeah. it's putting all those things into it. I couldn't mm -hmm. agree with you more. Where, where it gets very tricky, and we see this a lot on the advisory council, is, is uh, in areas where really culture has changed, um, where you go back 500 years, 1,000 years to biblical times, um, ivory had a status that was up there with gold, silver, pearl, ivory, and a lot of very important art um, is carved in ivory because it was something that was treasured. And society's views of ivory have changed over time. So a lot of the tension we're seeing in, in the advisory council is you have really unexpected opponents of the ivory ban. Uh, you know, sort of upper west side liberals like me, um, where your next door neighbor is a museum director. Um, and they are trying to bring in a, um, you know, a, an exhibition that has important 15th century art that has ivory pieces in it, and initially they can't bring it in. Now, um, musicians uh, are another another um, group that was was quite vocal about the ivory ban. What Fish and Wildlife has done, and of course Bob knows this much better than I do, is has carved out exceptions because they recognize that you just can't overnight just cut off um, the fact that we have so much of our culture, our artistic culture, it, it, it reflects um, carvings in ivory, or is reflected in carvings in ivory. All right, uh, questions from the floor? Yes? Um, uh, I found it, it, it extremely inspiring listening to the two panels, and I'd like uh, to read the question based on that. I think uh, the issue of wildlife crime uh, could, could be looked at another way, uh, as a matter of the way we put it, as wildlife conservation uh, and uh, the conservation which is sustainable and the issue of sustainability and relationship to, to economic development that was brought by Mr. Delaro. Uh, so uh, what was interesting in seeing the uh, details was also what uh, Dr. Bennett said that if you close off one uh, direction, pathway of trafficking, another one opens up. So uh, what seems to me is a philosophical problem over here, that uh, if you look at cost-benefit analysis, that's a, a problem of perceived cost and perceived benefit, uh, direct uh, uh, cost and direct benefit, not the consequences. So we are really ignoring the law of, quote, unquote, unintended consequences. So how we address the issue of consequences it has something to do with causation. And that's where I'm coming from, uh, that uh, on the basis of causation, one would consider the idea of uh, what would be a desirable state uh, where everyone is free to do what they want to do. And at the same time, uh, that such freedom of choice enables democratic and free market systems to operate within the context of institutions of rights, as has been historically evolving. So from that standpoint, the question I have is an idea of freedom of choice, which is available to everybody. So freedom it requires a free society. And that's where the conundrum is, that society cannot exist without caring for the other but why care for the other if you are free not to do so? So how do we have a free society? And that's why. So I think your your freedom ends when it encroaches on another another's freedom. And we can either put that into sort of ecocentric terms and say that we would include um, all species of fauna and maybe even flora in that. Or we can just take a, an anthropocentric view and say, you know, your freedom ends uh, when it uh, when it goes against my freedom to have some uh, protected to protection of species. And I think the other thing that that 
you didn't factor in is the, the idea of the next generations and maintaining a certain level of ecological integrity and the options of values for those future generations. That would be. And, and I'll add to that. I mean, I think I think an assumption when you take sort of an extreme free market view is that free markets are fair, and the reality is that free markets are not fair. Um, and um, and we, we can all come up with thousands of examples where think you know people left to their own devices end up just. Uh, polluting water, polluting air, taking more than their share, and so we set up governments. And so governments have regulations to avoid the prisoner's dilemma and the race to the bottom. Um, and this is just, you know, taking that concept which started government, at least conceptually, and, you know, here we are. And so um, th the same thing that regulates Wall Street, that regulates uh, crime, just the, the whole idea of property and theft. Is, is government just sort of imposing that on us because it makes for a more efficient society. There's nothing fundamental about property or a law against theft. We just order our society that way. We have a crisis that we're killing all our animals. And so we, we have a sovereigns that have to set up rules and enforce those rules to stop it. I don't want to go into it. Yeah. The other the other thing I would add too is that you know when we think about freedom it becomes complicated because we are dealing with different cultural values and obviously on the one side we can say we want we don't want to risk imposing you know one set of values on on another community but that just to bring back to my talk I mean I think that also feeds into questions about how we should navigate you know trophy hunting and captive breeding and and other sources because you know are we are we going to say that it's okay for some rich folks from Texas I can say that my husband's from Texas uh, rich folks from Texas you know get to go and kill the most you know iconic species but you know we should be really critical of China and Vietnam because they want to use uh, products from those species. I think that's problematic too. So we have to navigate fairness in all sorts of ways and freedoms in all sorts of ways. Yeah, and the other one is bottom line is just sustainability as well, is the mm -hmm. fact that when there were a lot fewer people and uh, who had no money and there was no global market, then it, to some extent it was going to be self-regulating. But now you've got absolutely totally open markets. Something can be in a forest in Africa one day and in a market in New York within 24 hours. And there's six and a half billion people on the planet, all of a large proportion of whom have got money to buy some of these items. And so, you know, if, if it was completely uncontrolled um, and people all had the freedom to buy what they wanted, it would run out really fast. May I respond to this? Mm -hmm. uh, what is interesting in this is that essentially the position has been Hobbesian, that one needs a Leviathan to enforce uh, order. Uh, uh, and there was Locke's position that uh, human beings are social animals, are uh, naturally inclined to share. But there are problems of uh, philosophy, which is ethical relativism. Who decides for whom? And that is my point, that uh, we need to address certain philosophical issues of philosophy of science which have defied uh, a resolution because as uh, J Joan Robinson of Cambridge University who was an economist had said, in the long run it is all about the short run. So how do we have a long run approach and I feel that's a, a, a crisis right now globally mm -hmm. and that needs to be part of that. So, so I, I agree that, that that is always a problem and I don't think that just goes away because we say, oh, well, this, you know, that should go away. We'll always have conflict and we'll always have debates. Um, I do want to just counter, though, on John Locke. I mean, John Locke's position was that once everybody uh, has taken all the land, um, you have a situation of scarcity, and at that point, humans will create a government. Now, if the government is tyrannous, they can take back the power, justifying the American Revolution, but... Uh, the point is that once you reach scarcity and once you start to impact sustainability, although he wouldn't have used the word, uh, you, you do need some kind of institution to navigate everybody's freedom. So I, I don't think that's just Hobbesian. Yeah, and, and I, I'd add to that. I mean, 
you know, if you have sort of a Lockean view of property rights, um, that there's something holy about property rights, there's something holy about property rights. I don't think that's the way that sort of the mainstream these days. I mean, yes, property rights are written into the Constitution, but really property rights are there because the government says we're going to order our society this way. Um, and you know, the answer to it is, is yes, we can have debates about Hobbes and Locke and Plato and, and all this other stuff, but we have a constitution, we have a government, we have a UN, and, and this is the way we've set it up at this point. And we have limited resources, and how do you allocate those resources among people is the way you set up your society. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw in the fact that I think there's a real kernel of painful truths in this discussion, and that is that in this field, we find ourselves over and over again trying to interact with um, cultures and communities that have different values and different sort of uh, historical and traditional values. And we're trying to influence them to recognize something like wildlife conservation. And it can be, it, you can do it in an overbearing way, and so that you are contested within the which really tries to encourage them to take the lead amongst themselves, as I think some of the, the rangeland uh, trusts and, and conservation uh, conservancies in Kenya have done. Um, but it's really essential that you figure out how to do it effectively, because you cannot impose this kind of a, of a, of a, of a, of a order of anti-poaching and conservation on a people, on their backs, without their willing engagement and caring for the same values. And so you have to you have to build it from the ground up. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, what uh, what we do with at WCS and our various partners is, is basically our bottom line is we want the system to be sustainable and to conserve all the, all the wildlife and the resources within the system. Um, but we're very pragmatic as the way you do that because it's going to be very different if you're dealing with the Tikana people in, in Bolivia to when you're dealing with, with, um, with groups around some of the national parks in India. And so... Uh, that clearly has to do, uh, what Robert has just suggested, is, is build on what are the local value systems, what are the local expertise, and what are the local needs, and then build up from that. But in every case, your end goal is, is, is the same. But how you get there, and how you involve local people to get there, is totally different in each case, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to groups like animal welfare groups, who would be much more pragmatic, hardline. This is, this is you know, this, this has a, a value rather than being more pragmatic as you go along. And it's not just a law enforcement thing. I mean, we talked to, no. Bob talked about this earlier. It's, it's both demand and then also perception of value locally. You can change demand. Um, you know, nobody wants as an engagement room, uh, uh, an engagement ring, a blood diamond. Um, you would be shocked to have a blood diamond. And that's because we demonized that. Uh, when I was a kid, everybody would throw cigarettes on the ground or they would smoke in restaurants. Nobody throws cigarettes on the ground anymore. And if they do, you, you they're odd, and nobody smokes in a restaurant. We've changed society because the government decided to indoctrinate us for good to, to stop <laughs> doing that. Um, and in the, the range countries, where the source countries, uh, where, where the, the uh, wildlife comes from, you can, over time, impress upon them the value of the wildlife. And, and you know, I think restitution is one way you could do that, but I think uh, really just by educating the local societies that this is something that's important to their future. Yeah, you, and, uh, oh, no, well, go. well I, I just want I, I mean, I don't, when I'm talking about the problems of, of dual stream markets or having these some of these incomplete bans, I don't want to be understood to be saying, oh, we should just ban everything and impose that. Absolutely not. Um, you know, but what we should understand that the, is that it's complex and that one sim one apparently simple solution doesn't really get to the heart of the matter, which is in fact uh, the need for communities to be uh, invested if, if, if it's going to happen. And just very quickly, in terms of uh, demand changing, uh, when I was a kid, which was a bit ago now, um, <laughs> in, uh, in England, um, our house, like lots of other houses, had ivory knife handles, ivory billiard balls, um, uh, ivory piano keys, and it wasn't even just government imposing that, it just became socially unacceptable. And so within my lifetime, that's changed within England, and I'm actually very confident that the same can happen in China. All right, I think we are out of time. Uh, uh, I uh, hope that uh, those of you who still have questions will have time to, uh, uh, to stay with us uh, with, for the reception and, 
and, and get a chance to pose those questions there. Um, let me uh, close by thanking our panelists for uh, coming here and uh, sharing their, uh, uh, their experiences with us. Um, and to uh, 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 congratulate the uh, organizers of this symposium uh, and, and the editors uh, uh, who uh, put this together. Uh, it, uh, uh, I know it takes a, a lot of work to put one of these things uh, uh, together, and um, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's been very successful. Um, uh, and I think we, uh, uh, we owe a round of applause to our panelists uh, and, uh, and to uh, Marika and the other editors who've, who've put this all together.